Enter the Chengdu J-20, nicknamed the Mighty Dragon, China's bold counter to America's air dominance. But is this fifth-generation stealth fighter truly a formidable challenger or just an elaborate facade symbolizing China's struggle to match US prowess in the skies? Join us as we delve deep into the J-20's capabilities and limitations, unraveling the mystery. Is it a genuine contender in the world of aerial warfare or a mere imitation, falling short of its lofty aspirations? Let's unravel the secrets of the mighty dragon and discover what truly lies beneath its stealthy exterior. The genesis of the J-20 can be traced back to the late 20th century, when Chinese military officials first announced their ambition to develop a fifth-generation stealth aircraft. Was this announcement a strategic bluff or an admission of their technological shortcomings? The answer remained shrouded in secrecy. The emergence of the JXX program in the early 2000s, believed to be the precursor to the J-20, added fuel to the fire of speculation. Prior to this, China's aerial might was represented by the J-10s, third-generation fighters that entered service in the late 90s. As the story of the J-20 unfolded, the project was tightly veiled in secrecy, sparking endless conjectures and theories. It wasn't until 2010 that the J-20 first flexed its muscles on the ground, followed by its inaugural flight test in 2011. When the J-20 began its journey, its early tests started to peel back the layers of mystery surrounding its capabilities. The aircraft wasn't just another addition to the skies, it was a statement by China a signal of its intent to redefine air power, particularly in strategically crucial regions. But how did the J-20's design and features align with this ambitious goal? Crafted as a twin-jet engine stealth fighter, the J-20 was tailored for dominating the skies above the contentious territories of the South China Sea and the East China Sea. It adopted a canard configuration, reminiscent of its predecessor, the J-10, yet diverging from the designs of America's modern F-22 and F-35. In terms of size, the J-20 stands out as one of the largest stealth aircraft ever built, slightly longer than its counterparts but with a somewhat smaller wingspan. The story of the J-20 didn't stop after its initial flights in 2011 and 12. In pursuit of technological parity with advanced Russian and American designs, the aircraft underwent a series of upgrades. But what specific enhancements were made, and how did these changes position the J-20 in the global arena of stealth fighters? The journey of the J-20, it seemed, was as much about evolution and adaptation as it was about innovation and ambition. The first among them was an upgrade to its engine. According to the initial reports, China didn't have the technology and expertise to create a fifth-generation-worthy jet engine. Chengdu, the company that designs and builds the J-20s, managed to acquire an improved version of the Russian Saturn AL-31 engine, AL-31FM2. However, the engines were sealed to prevent tampering and reverse engineering. The initial engine choice had several drawbacks. First, it was too large, too loud, and too emission-heavy to be not tracked by enemy radar or positioning technology. As such, the plane's stealth technology and design were largely negated by the presence of a bulky engine that created a large flare behind it. Second, the engine couldn't vector its thrust. Thrust vectoring is vital engine technology that allows the jet to change its angular velocity without rotating the plane itself. This means the plane wasn't as maneuverable as those with thrust vectoring, such as the F-22, which is widely considered to be the plane the Chinese were aiming to beat. Third, the engine failed to incorporate supercruise, meaning it couldn't fly at max speeds without repowering its afterburners. As a result, the plane could be tracked via heat sensors while in high-speed flight, a fact that would be crucial if it were in any real combat scenario. Supercruising is yet another feature present in the F-22, making the J-20, a plane designed over 15 years later, technologically lag behind the last-generation model of the US. Finally, the engine's power, which directly influences the plane's maximum speed and payload capacity, was too low. According to the technical specs, the AL-31 can only output 145 kN, 4.5 tons of thrust, far behind the maximum power of contemporary American models. This meant that the J-20 would be far too slow in its initial iteration to ever get in effective weapon range, even if it was equipped with some of the most powerful air-to-air -air missiles. By the way, Chinese missiles are considered actually superior to the most commonly used American alternatives but still don't make up for the technological gap in supporting equipment and weaponry. 
This led to multiple iterations of engine upgrades to slowly add on the capabilities that the F-22 and F-35 aircraft already had a decade before. First, the engine was upgraded with a domestic WS-10, with three different models, and finally the current WS-15. Each step forward in the J-20's development not only ramped up its engine power, but also filled in some crucial gaps in the stealth technology arena. Despite these strides, it appears that the J-20 still doesn't quite stack up to the F-119 engines, the powerhouse behind America's stealth fighters. So this raises a compelling puzzle. How exactly does the J-20 fall short, and in what specific aspects is it trailing behind the advanced F-119s? Let's get into it. For example, the WS-15 doesn't have recessed nozzles, so the engine still has issues with thermal management and will likely stand out like a Christmas tree for any infrared-seeking systems. This can nullify any and all attempts to over-engineer the plane to contain current generation stealth technology in other areas. Additionally, there have been conflicting reports of the engine's power. According to the specifications reported by the Chinese media and military, the newest iteration of the WS-15 achieved a thrust of 18 tons, outpacing the F-119's 15.6 tons. However, this may have been a way for China to appear technologically superior. Many aviation bloggers believe that the US and China are using different tests to report the engine's maximum power. According to some, the WS-15 specs are based on high-altitude flight testing, it's part of the three main testing sequences, along with ground stand testing and ground mounted testing. The nominal thrust recorded during high altitude testing is the highest among the three. The report from the Chinese military would align with previous practices of announcing the best number to boost numbers and showcase prominence or stir up controversy. On the other hand, the US companies report the lowest recorded number of the three available tests, usually one of the ground tests. Therefore, the figure for the F-119s is likely from one of those two. In some simulations, it's speculated that the nominal thrust of an engine can rise more than 20% when switching from ground to high-altitude flight tests. This means that the F-119s with an estimated high-altitude thrust of between 35,000 and 39,000 pounds of force most likely have comparable, if not higher, power to the WS-15 engines if the tests were equal. Keep in mind that Chinese engines were also developed decades after F-22s became locked in their current configurations, so they are far behind the curve of modern engine design. Additionally, American F-35s use an upgraded version of the F-119 engine, the F-135, that maximizes thrust in exchange for removing supercruise capacity. Apart from sheer power, it seems that the Chinese engines have a much lower lifetime expectancy than American models. In some reports, the WS-10 could withstand 1,500 hours of use, while the WS-15 upgraded that to 4,000 hours. However, both figures pale in comparison to the F-119 and F-135s, which were rated for 12,000 hours. The stark difference in the expected lifespan means that Chinese engines are likely subject to much higher rates of wear and part malfunction. In the event of hostile actions between Chinese and American air forces, the J-20s would likely need to be recalled more often for repairs, and many airplanes could become grounded over time simply because their engines gave out. On the plus side for China, it's ordered many more J-20s than the US currently has in its command. According to reports from 2022, China fielded more than 200 of these aircraft, compared to the US, which only has 187 available and no plan for future production. By contrast, China is still producing more planes, with some estimates suggesting that it broke the 250 aircraft mark in 2023 and aims to field more than 1,000 J-20s by 2030. This leads to the fact that China is actively ordering and producing more engines for its aircraft, while the US would be forced to renegotiate and re-engage its existing contracts to repair supplies. However, China's production model is trying to emphasize quantity, with planes built similarly to a conveyor belt. This means that a sudden supply chain issue, something that has globally happened to multiple resources or tech pieces, could invariably have a domino effect and slow down new production pieces to a trickle. The supply chain issue could also be exacerbated by the fact that China has to import a lot of minerals and other materials to meet its industrial demand. In the event of mass armed conflict, it's not out of the realm of possibility that China could lose some of its trading partners. There's no telling how that would affect China's mass production capabilities for engines and other aircraft parts. Even more critically, it appears that China depends on the US itself to deliver the materials and parts necessary to build the plane's tail section. Since the tail needs to endure significant heat, 
up to 3000 Celsius with afterburners, and pressures up to 10 times atmospheric, these parts are vital in ensuring the planes can maintain flight. A conflict between the two nations would directly inhibit China's capacity to produce more airworthy planes. China likely needs at least several more years to reach the technological and industrial capacity and levels capable of domestically producing all the necessary pieces to create a J-20 from scratch. As such, it's impossible to predict whether China will have enough engines and spare parts to field an adequate fleet of J-20s while also sufficiently servicing them in a drawn-out war for air superiority. Apart from the engine, the rest of the airplane doesn't seem to have undergone significant technological advancements compared to the contemporary F-22s and F-35s. For example, the stealth technology of the J-20s has been repeatedly called into question by multiple sources, not least of which is the US Air Force. In one report by the Indian military, their radar was able to accurately detect and track J-20s while they were flying close to the border. This was during the most recent border disputes between India and China. These are recurring incidents between the countries and are likely responsible for India solidifying its ties to the US and the rest of the West. However, we must keep in mind that the show of force could also be another of China's ploys to misdirect the public before any actual conflict takes place. In many cases, military aircraft are fitted with detachable add-ons called Lunenburg lenses. These spherical metallic pieces actively reflect radio signals to the receiver, making the aircraft visible during training operations. This masks the actual radar signature of the plane when the lenses are removed, such as in conflict scenarios. The wide availability of lenses means that the J-20s might have sufficient stealth technology beyond the report suggested by the Indian military. However, according to claims from the former US Air Force Chief of Staff Michael Ryan, the design of the J-20s looks remarkably similar to that of the F-117. This is a first-generation stealth airplane with technology dating back from the 70s and 80s. If this were true, then China's ultimate aircraft would be far behind the curve. In simulations based on the approximate specifications revealed by Chinese media and inferred capabilities, the J-20s could be locked onto by a ground-based Type 99 anti-aircraft gun. This means that the US could potentially deploy these guns in islands around the East China Sea and effectively cut off J-20s from much of their proposed effective range. Where the Mighty Dragon supposedly shines is in its effective engagement range. According to claims made by the Chinese military, the J-20 has an effective range of roughly 1,200 miles. Compare this to its modern counterparts, with F-22s having a range of 530 miles, F-35Bs 581 miles, and Shukhoi Su-57s range of 930 miles. This would mean that the Chinese Air Force could fly its planes from the Chinese coast and well into the South or East China Sea to attack US bases scattered throughout the islands in the Indo-Pacific. Furthermore, this would mean that military bases and hangars housing the planes could be protected by robust anti-air weaponry to dissuade counterattacks. Furthermore, China has a small edge in air-to-air -air missiles. The J-20 can carry four PL-15 long-range air-to-air missiles with an operational range of between 120 and 190 miles. By comparison, the US Air Force currently uses AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles with an effective range of only 100 miles. The US is aiming to replace its supply with advanced AIM-260 JATAM missiles with an effective range of at least 120 miles to counter Chinese missile supremacy. However, Lockheed Martin is still currently refining the design of the missiles, with production expected to start later in 2024. Even then, the US likely won't get a significant supply of these missiles by 2026. Additionally, the J-20 holds another two PL-10 short-to-mid-range air-to-air missiles in its side hangars. These side missile bays also represent one of the first notable improvements in the J-20 over the F-22s. Namely, the side bays use rotating rail carriers that allow the missiles to remain connected to the plane while being fed targeting information. At the same time, the side bay doors can close with the missile primed for firing, reducing the loss of aerodynamics. One area in which the Chinese seem to be underdeveloped in the J-20 is the autocannon. Specifically, the airplane has no autocannon options at all, leaving it pretty much defenseless in an actual dogfighting scenario. Reports and speculations from aviation experts suggest that this was a concerted effort to maximize the plane's long-range capabilities. As such, the Chinese military apparently believes that dogfighting as a practice is likely to be completely abandoned in modern air-to-air -air warfare. 
Due to the aircraft's long-range effectiveness, it will likely excel at picking off distant ground targets or be focused on taking down enemy aircraft beyond their effective radar range due to superior missiles. However, even if this becomes the norm, some dogfighting between planes is likely to happen on a smaller scale, which can put J-20s in significant danger. To accentuate its shift to long-range operations, Chengdu has also developed a two-seater version of the J-20, dubbed J-20S. This model allows the second plane operator to coordinate communications between multiple aircraft, or even share its status and targeting information with naval and ground forces. It could also reduce the chance of human error due to information overload with sensors outputting more and more relevant flight and combat data to the pilot. Additionally, the second operator could likely more actively interact with drones and AI-operated vehicles, especially considering recent reports that China is making strides in AI for combat training and active use. However, what the J-20 seems to lack compared to the US stealth aircraft models is the capacity to be refueled mid-flight. This might not be as much of a disadvantage if China were to fight a war close to its borders, and all speculations suggest that this may be the case, but it clearly showcases that the Chinese military technology is still behind in a few critical areas that the US military has solved years before to achieve its current air superiority. In the end, the ability for F-22s and F-35s to fly longer might mean that they will get an edge over J-20s in some scenarios. This directly clashes with the J-20's intended use as a long-range cruising aircraft that deploys missiles against targets. Furthermore, in some reports, it's been suggested that the radar and stealth capabilities of the J-20 are below those of the Su-57s, which are already lagging behind F-22s. This means that an approaching F-22 could feasibly get within a range where American current missiles would be more than effective at taking down a J-20 before the US airplane itself even gets noticed. The flaws in Chinese radar technology, or rather the US's unparalleled stealth advances, could invalidate all efforts by the Chinese military to gain a foothold of air superiority in its own country. It should also be mentioned that China has been repeatedly called out for mimicking or even flat-out stealing foreign technology before, and similar patterns have arisen with the J-20. For example, much of its external appearance resembles the scrapped MiG-1.44 design made by the Soviet Union in the 1990s. The MiG showcased the aerodynamic potential of close canard design, which has been transferred over to the J series of Chinese planes nearly identically. As such, it's fair to say that China has somehow acquired or reverse-engineered the technology and specifications involved in the MiG-1.44 project. Some aviation experts conclude that the canard design of the J-20 is an evolution of the existing J-9, which was contemporary to or even preceded the MiG-1.44. They also suggested that the limitations imposed by the requirements of stealth fighters leave little room for the variety in shaping modern aircraft. Additionally, many consider the current specs of the J-20 to be based on significant data leaks of F-35 specifications, as well as clandestine efforts of Chinese cyber military forces to hack into US military bases. A report from 2014 suggested that a Chinese citizen, Su Bin, was arrested in Canada and accused of hacking into the systems of Lockheed Martin and Boeing, two of the major producers of parts for F-22s and F-35s. China also received a significant boon in Kosovo in 1999, where a F-117 Nighthawk was shot down in combat. China could ferry the wreckage from Kosovo thanks to its ties to Russia and Serbia, and Kosovo was a province of Serbia at the time, which could have feasibly allowed it to reverse-engineer much of its capabilities. Still, remember that the F-117 is a far older design than the F-22, which also makes this consistent with earlier reports from the US Air Force that stealth technologies of the J-20 and F-117 were similar. With China's previous examples of technological adaptation, it's clear that the J-20 can be considered an effort to bring the country's air force in line with the Western worlds. However, the current efforts have been undermined by the country's inability to properly implement or strategize on its technological integrations. This can be seen in the fighter jet's final design. Although initially touted as an all-purpose airplane, the J-20 has sacrificed nearly all short-range combat and dogfighting capacity to maintain long-range communications and weaponry. However, the weapons payload of the J-20, limited to only six missiles, is lacking when compared to the eight missile capacity of the F-22. As a result, the plane loses out in both long- and close-range combat against enemy aircraft, making its bombing capability and effective targeting range its main upsides. 
Finally, China's stealth technology is likely woefully behind the curve. Suppose China did indeed copy its stealth program from the felled F-117s and leaked F-35 data. In that case, the US will also have all the information it needs to effectively counteract the methods used by the J-20 if it doesn't significantly deviate from the original designs. There are two key areas where the J-20 can outcompete modern US fighter jets – maximum altitude and sheer numbers. According to specs released by the Chinese media, the J-20 can fly at altitudes of up to 66,000 feet, which is 8,000 feet higher than the F-22. This means that a fleet of J-20s could dodge F-22s by flying over them and reaching the more vulnerable ground bases in the Indo-Pacific. Keep in mind that these missions would require the planes to be fitted with air-to-ground ordnance, making them even less effective in aerial combat. The other advantage of the Chinese fleet of planes is its expected size. While the US currently maintains clear air supremacy due to technological advantages, the US Army fields less than 200 F-22s and around 350 F-35s. Additionally, F-22s are no longer being produced, and Lockheed Martin is slowly producing an order of 2,000 aircraft made by the various branches of the US Army. By contrast, estimates suggest that China has already produced 250 J-20s and is planning to field around 1,000 by 2030. However, depending on which contractor can produce airplanes faster, the US Air Force may have fewer latest-generation aircraft in its fleet at a certain point. This can be offset by the US actively trying to develop new airplanes to counteract the rising China threat and maintain its grip on the sky. In fact, the prototype of a sixth-generation fighter was previewed in 2020. However, the US Army has refused to provide more information on the aircraft, including which manufacturer will be primarily responsible for developing and producing them. The US Air Force is pursuing improvements over the current F-22 model via the Next Generation Air Dominance NGAD, program which started in 2014. Its two most probable producers are Boeing and Lockheed Martin after Northrop Grumman dropped out of the bidding phase in 2023. The US Navy had announced the FAXX program way back in 2012. Its current goal seems to be replacing the older FA-18 class of fighter aircraft and either complementing or phasing out F-35s from widespread use across the US fleets. Both of these programs are expected to start producing sixth-generation aircraft around 2030. These developments coincide with the US Marine Corps Force Design 2030 plan to restructure the Marines into a more self-sufficient task force that can hold and defend vital bases on islands in the South and East China Seas. The Force Design 2030 should improve the Marines' resilience to air-to-ground attacks and make them into a multidisciplinary force that can coordinate with the Air Force's efforts. These advancements are likely to considerably undermine China's air authority in the area and maintain the American stranglehold on air superiority. As such, it's pretty clear that the J-20 has arrived a few years too late to the global scene. Even with the most recent additions of the WS-15 engines, the planes are simply too technologically behind the contemporary Western models. In the era where fifth-generation fighter jets are likely going to be phased out, planes that only supposedly can match their aerial competitiveness, with no actual backing, are unlikely to stick for long. If China's rate of development doesn't change in the rest of the 2020s and the US successfully manages to keep its program secret, then the status quo should remain as is. It looks like the mighty dragon might not be so mighty after all. But what do you think? Can China mount a successful offensive using its fleet of J-20s before the US develops next-generation jets? Is China overblowing its fighter jet capabilities? Let us know in the comments section below. Now go and check out why the Type 99 Chinese tank sucks, or click this other video instead. The Tank – A Game-Changing Weapon of War First thundered across the trenches of the Somme in 1916. Since then, the evolution of these armored beasts has been rapid and revolutionary especially during the 1940s, when armored warfare became a decisive element in conflicts. But what about China's journey with tanks? It wasn't until the 1950s, after enduring internal turmoil and external conflicts, that China finally began crafting its own main battle tanks. Starting from a position of playing catch-up, the Chinese defense industry has been relentless in its pursuit to advance in tank design by any means necessary. In this episode, we turn our focus to China's latest feat in armored warfare, the Type 99 main battle tank. A product of the new millennium, the Type 99 stands as a statement to China's technological leap in this field. 
But what do we really know about this elusive tank, given that much of the information comes from government sources and is yet to prove itself in combat? How did the Chinese tank development journey shape the Type 99? And what does the Type 99 tell us about China's current and future military capabilities? Let's delve into the past, present, and potential future of Chinese armored warfare to unravel the mysteries of the Type 99. But before we dive into the history, let's quickly refresh our understanding of the terminology when we talk about generations of tanks. This expression, used as a means of summarizing levels of technological advancement, is generally used to refer to tank development after the Second World War. The first generation of tanks are those that emerged at the tail end of the war and into the 1950s, with heavy armor and gyro-stabilized guns, usually between 105 and 125 mm, they became known as main battle tanks. Good examples of a first-generation tank would be the British Centurion, the Russian T-54-55, the American M-48 Patton, and the Chinese Types 59 and 61. The second generation of tanks arrived between the 1950s and 80s, depending on the technological skills and resources of different nations. Here, the emphasis was on technological developments rather than necessarily bigger guns or thicker armor. Second-generation tanks were much better able to operate at night with infrared vision and were also designed to operate in nuclear, biological, or chemical war conditions. Examples of second-generation tanks include the British Chieftain, the Swedish Stridsvagen 103, the American M60 Patton, the Soviet T-62, and the Chinese Types 59 and 61. Some tanks had more advanced forms of armored protection, such as Cobham armor. As the third generation of tanks emerged in the late 1980s, with advanced features like composite armor and sophisticated fire control systems, it raises a question. How did China, starting without strong industrial capabilities or tank design expertise, progress in this complex field? Where did China's journey in armored vehicle design begin, and how did it evolve over time? Without any serious industrial base and technological knowledge of tank design, Chinese tank development came slowly, piecemeal, and mainly from other countries. In the 1920s, some Chinese warlords brought a few French armored cars. In the 30s, small amounts of light armored vehicles, armored cars, and tankettes such as the Italian CV-35 and the British Carden Lloyd from several countries were in the country. This presence came from different military missions as European countries began to show interest in the political and military situation in China. Advisors from the Soviet Union, Germany, and Italy were there during this time, and Chinese forces fighting the Japanese could point to a curious mix of Soviet, the T-26, German, the Panzer Mark I, and the SDKF Z222 armored car, Italian and British armored vehicles in their arsenal. There was no coherent doctrine for the use of these weapons, and they were generally distributed along the front line without any attempt to concentrate forces. Most were destroyed in fighting, but accessing spares and keeping the disparate pieces of equipment serviceable was another key challenge. In the early 1940s, the Chinese government was able to assemble one mechanized division, the 200th, which had a tank regiment largely equipped with the Soviet T-26 light tanks that were more or less obsolete. The division's record was patchy, defeating the Japanese in at least one major battle but suffering massive losses in another. There does not appear to be any record of tank versus tank actions between the Japanese and Chinese forces, nor any evidence that the Chinese had even considered how a tank versus tank action might be addressed. After Pearl Harbor, with the arrival of the US into the Pacific theater, the Americans made more concerted efforts to get military hardware to the hard-pressed Chinese forces. Plans to get 600 obsolete American T-16 light tanks to China were abandoned. Even the Chinese recognized that these were inadequate pieces of equipment. Later, the American Lend-Lease program was to provide nearly 300 M2, M3, and M5 light tanks, and even 35 M4 Shermans. The 200th Mechanized Division continued to serve in Burma under U.S. General Stilwell, where it won two large battles but was ultimately crushed at the battle for the Sipor Magok Highway. After the Second World War, the Soviet Union provided 1,300 T-34-85 tanks for use by the People's Liberation Army, the PLA. This was a major increase in capability. Chinese factories later produced copies of the T-34 and fought battles against American forces during the Korean War. This time, there was some tank-on-tank -tank combat. A U.S. study in 1954 calculated that there had been over 100 definite-to-possible tank-against-tank actions. In the mid-1950s, China began designing its own tank. What became known as the Type 59 was heavily influenced by the Soviet T-54-55 series. 
It was the first tank that the Chinese defense industry had ever built and was produced in great numbers, perhaps over 10,000. It was used from the 1950s to the 80s. This was a great leap forward for the Chinese defense industry, and the tank slowly upgraded with domestic improvements and some Western technology through the years of its operational life. One general and unchangeable strategic problem that China has for its own self-defense is the nature of the terrain in the south of the country. For its time, the T-59 was a heavy tank, and the south was not suitable. Boggy paddy fields, mountains, hills, and rivers were hard to negotiate. In addition, what bridges there were could not bear the weight. A lighter tank, the Type 62, was introduced in 1963. The need for lightness and mobility in a tank was always a feature that was to influence Chinese tank design. As a comparison, the Type 99 tank weighs about 58 tons, and the latest versions of the M1 Abrams weigh over 70 tons. In 1969, Soviet and Chinese forces fought a short, sharp border conflict. At one point, there were one and a half million soldiers from both sides lining the frontier. It was a serious wake-up call for the Chinese People's Liberation Army. They realized that Chinese tanks were significantly inferior to a range of modern Soviet tanks of the period, the T-62, 64, and the 72. A captured Soviet T-62 was used as a base to copy from and enhance the T-59. This resulted in the Type 69 and later the Type 79. They were still similar to the Type 59, but they had upgrades from captured or Western technologies, but neither was particularly good. They were not the significant increase in capability that had been hoped for. Many were sold overseas instead, including to Iran and Iraq. In their favor, they were cheap, sturdy, and uncomplicated to maintain. But while they might have looked good rolling around the Victory Day parades of any puffed-up local dictator, their actual fighting capability was much open to question. The Chinese defense industry tried again. With a warming in relations between China and the West in the 1980s, China gained access to some Western military technology particularly from the United Kingdom, which provided an advanced Marconi fire control system and a potent L7 105mm gun. It had received even more modern Western technology incorporated into the Chinese tank design, including an Austrian gun and a German engine. The Type 88 was a useful stopgap, but there were more wake-up calls. Chinese tanks exported to the Middle East had been involved in several wars, the Iran-Iraq War of 1980-88, the First Gulf War of 1991, and even the Second Gulf War in 2003. Under these testing battlefield conditions, it was demonstrated clearly that Chinese tanks were vastly inferior to pretty much every single Western main battle tank. And the news on the Soviet side was not much better. China managed to get hold of a T-72, possibly one captured by Iran during the Iran-Iraq War, and covertly handed over to China. The Chinese defense industry was learning that Western tank guns could defeat the T-72 and the T-72 could defeat all Chinese tanks. This was not a good place to be for an aspiring superpower. As a priority, China needed to produce a credible third-generation tank and ideally also significantly upgrade its second-generation armor into the bargain. It seems that there were two schools of tank design thought within Chinese tank designers at the time. One idea was to retain the basic structure of the T-72 and build on that. The other was to take a more radical approach and lean heavily into the more modern design of the Israeli Makava. The Makava seems to have been a bit too progressive an option. They went for the T-72, which they had direct experience of and which had so impressed and worried them. This then was the challenge. China had not made any significant progress with the design of a main battle tank in 20 years and what progress there had been had been largely dependent on Western technology or Soviet designs. Now Chinese engineers were attempting to leap from the first generation to third generation in as short a space of time as possible. A one-armed PLA veteran and tank designer Zhu Yu Sheng was brought out of retirement and given his mission to produce a homegrown main battle tank that could go up against the latest Western and Soviet designs. Something that could defeat a T-80 and produce a comparable performance to the Leopard 2 it was a big ask. As he noted himself, it was not as if other countries had been asleep during this time. The Type 90 was a first effort, with an attempt to make an export version for Pakistan. The designers struggled to bridge the gap in requirements. They need a tank that would work in both China's arid climate but also the blistering heat of Pakistani desert terrain. It was not successful. Another design, the Type 95, also fell by the wayside. Production was stopped in 1988 because it was not judged good enough. It was exported to Pakistan, and the designers returned to their drawing boards. As China's initial attempts with the Type 90 and Type 95 faced challenges and setbacks, 
What led to the development of the more successful Type 99? How did China's approach shift to meet the diverse terrain challenges and technological needs in their quest for an advanced battle tank? In 1997, a significant shift occurred with the unveiling of the Type 96, marking a step in the right direction with its lighter frame and suitability for varied terrains. The evolution continued with the Type 98's debut at a Victory Day parade in 1999, showcasing enhanced electronics and a Western-style welded turret. This progression reflects the pragmatic philosophy of Zhu Yusheng, who believed in adopting the best design elements, irrespective of their Eastern or Western origins, to achieve success. Let's delve into how these developments paved the way for the birth of the Type 99 and what made it stand out in China's tank evolution. Further enhancements were made to the Type 98, and eventually, the Type 98G evolved into what we now understand as the Type 99. The Type 99 was first seen in 2000 and probably entered service in 2001. The updates to the Type 99 continued. We do not have the best sense of how many have been produced. By 2008, there may have been 200 of the Type 98 and Type 99 tanks available. At this point, it seems as if two specific tank regiments were equipped with these tanks, in Beijing and Shenyang, both in the northeast of the country, close to Mongolia, Russia and North Korea. There have been several upgraded variants of the tank, and there may now be over a thousand Type 99 variants in service. The bottom line is that this now seems to be a tank that the Chinese authorities are confident with and are using it as a platform for further enhancements. So let's pause there and take a look at what we now know about the original base-level capabilities of the Type 99. Given that the Chinese are understandably very secretive about their weapon systems and the tank has not been used in combat anywhere. It's clear that the Type 99 is a significant move forward for the Chinese tank industry. It still seems to be based on the chassis of the T-72, although it's a full meter longer, but with major improvements to more or less every aspect of the tank design. The hull and the turret are made of welded steel. In keeping with the Chinese design over the decades, it's a mix of Western and Russian design and technologies. One of the senior designers at Norinco, the major Chinese arms producer, has described the Type 99 as China's first informationized tank. The Type 99 has a crew of three and mounts a stabilized 125mm smoothbore gun that can fire a Russian-style reflex anti-tank guided missile down the barrel. This missile has a range of 5km in daylight and 4 at nighttime. Four missiles can be carried in the tank. The secondary weapons are a coaxial 7.62 machine gun and a 12.7mm heavy machine gun on the commander's cupola. The main gun can fire APFSDST, heat, and fragmentation rounds and can use either Warsaw Pact or Chinese ammunition. In keeping with the Soviet design, the tank has an automatic loader for the 125mm shells via a carousel located beneath the crew. This can deliver 8 rounds per minute on automatic and 1 or 2 rounds per minute when loaded manually. It carries 42 tank rounds, 22 of which can be loaded into the carousel. However, as the conflict in Ukraine has shown, Russian tanks have proven vulnerable when struck by anti-tank rounds or missiles. The carousel loader system is not well protected and many tanks have suffered catastrophic turret explosions as a result. This is a serious problem for which there is no obvious and immediate solution. Retaining the carousel design in Chinese tanks may point to a potential weakness that could be exposed in combat. A better protected location for the ammunition and perhaps blowout panels similar to the M1 Abrams might enhance the tank's survivability. The tank has spaced modular armor, with frontal armor reportedly equivalent to 1,000 to 1,200 mm of steel. The German diesel engine delivers 1,500 horsepower, giving a road speed of around 55 miles per hour. The Type 99 has a computerized fire control system, automatic fire suppression, MBC protection, and a range of countermeasures, including a laser-based self-defense weapon system, a laser warning receiver, and smoke grenades. The fire control system, rangefinder, and automatic tracker allow the tank to engage moving targets while on the move itself. Some of the Type 99 technology is believed to have been retrofitted onto the Type 96 tanks. Western assessments of the tank were mixed, although acknowledging the Type 99 was a significant step forward. Some analysts have speculated that the Type 99's fire control system might be better than that of the Russian T-90, but others have been less than impressed. Critics of the design have pointed out that some things are still lacking – protection against IEDs, roof protection, lack of blowout panels, and defense against the most modern anti-tank guided missiles. Some of these are combat lessons that Western-designed combat vehicles like the M1 Abrams have learnt the hard way. 
One analyst described the Type 99 as trying to force a second-generation tank into a third-generation model. But there were still improvements to come. In the mid-2000s, a new variant of the Type 99 emerged, the Type 99A. This brought a full range of further upgrades, including third-generation explosive reactive armor similar to the Russian Relict system. This could now offer protection against modern tandem anti-tank guided missiles. But it's not always clear what external changes to the tank mean and there is always a risk in speculating. The turret has been redesigned slightly, perhaps to incorporate more internal systems, possibly including third-generation thermal sites and a digital battle management system. The tank now weighs 58 tons, against the original reported weight of 54 tons. But the 1500 horsepower engine seems to handle the weight well, giving the Type 99A considerable mobility. But understandably accurate data about the T-99 remains a closely guarded secret. The Type 99A probably came into service in approximately 2013. By 2020, reports suggested that 840 T-99 tanks had been produced. In 2014, a combat engineering version of the Type 99 was spotted, with a crane and dozer blade fitted. There are several different Type 99 variant numbers reported by the Chinese and international media. Within these different variant numbers, there is still a certain amount of uncertainty as to which variants are which, which are the most up-to-date, and which are the most effective. Much of the information we have is difficult to confirm, but it does seem fair to say that a pretty significant upgrade took place when the tank moved from the base model, the Type 99, to the Type 99A. Some reports suggest that the Type 99A1 is now the most modern version of the tank. Others believe that the Type 99G is the most current. There is talk of a Type 99A2 being a much improved version, but other reports are categoric that an A2 version does not exist. Some analysts note that a Type 99KM model is in trial. The Type 99 has yielded a simplified export variant, known as the VT-1A, which has been sold to Bangladesh, Morocco and possibly others. A newer export version, the VT-4, may emerge in time. So, what does it all boil down to? For decades, Chinese tanks have been cheap copies of old Soviet equipment, a generation or two behind what the rest of the world was doing. But several wake-up calls changed things, particularly the conflict with the Soviet Union in 1969 and the Gulf War in 1991. These events undermined Chinese confidence and showed that none of their tanks were actually any good in combat. Now, Chinese designers have worked to take what they consider the best elements from Western and Russian main battle tanks and incorporate them into tanks that will fit China's unique strategic situation and requirements. Chinese tanks are still heavily influenced by Russia and America, but they are no longer slavish, low-grade copies. The gap between Chinese and American military hardware looks to be closing. It's fair to say that the Type 99 represents a step forward in terms of approach and capabilities for Chinese main battle tank development, and the latest upgraded versions of the Type 99 also appear to have further improved the tank. Is it a match for American, European, and Russian tanks? It's hard to say with confidence, but the days of the Gulf War, with dozens of blazing Chinese copies of Soviet tanks strewn across the battlefield, are probably over. There is one crucial element that the Chinese do not have its combat experience. No amount of training and simulation can fully test a country's doctrine, training, logistics, morale, and fighting capability, let alone the performance of a tank and its crew. The most likely rival for the Type 99 is the M1 Abrams. In Taiwan this year, the government will start replacing their M60s with 100 Abrams. The Abrams is a heavy and old tank, but it is a reliable and robust platform that's proven itself in many different fights. It has the upgrades and enhancements that reflect this experience. It would prove a formidable opponent in defense against a Chinese ground attack. The Type 99 main battle tank is an impressive piece of equipment that represents the current peak of Chinese tank development. Whether it will stay this way for long is unclear. It's hard to say whether the Type 99 has the staying power to lead China's tank force through the next two decades. The needs of tank design are constantly changing. The role of the tank is being reconsidered and revised. The advent of drones over battlefields in Ukraine has caused some military analysts to declare the tank obsolete. This is almost certainly premature, but drones, improving anti-tank missiles, and the unique challenges of urban combat will ensure that Chinese tank designers are going to be kept very, very busy. Now, go and check out China's brand new aircraft carrier versus USS Gerald R. Ford supercarrier, or click this other video instead. As China seeks to further its presence in the waters of the Pacific, 
It has commissioned a new supercarrier to add to its fleet that they are hoping will compete with the US Navy's new Gerald Ford supercarrier. But how does the Fujian compare to the Navy's newest addition to its carrier fleet? Does it have the technological capabilities to compete with modern blue water carrier fleets? What is the likely military doctrine that will outline its use in battle? In this video, we will seek to answer these questions and more. Let's delve right in. Much of what we know about the new Fujian is based on reconnaissance imagery and intelligence analysis. The Chinese Type 003 Fujian supercarrier has a 316-meter flight deck and has a beam of 76 meters at the flight deck. It is conventionally powered by eight boiler steam turbines, producing approximately 220,000 horsepower at its four shafts. The Fujian is expected to utilize electromagnetic catapults, a step up from the ski jump configuration of its predecessors. Its displacement will be about 80,000 tons with a full combat load, though recent intelligence suggests that it may actually displace closer to 100,000 tons. The ship will be crewed by approximately 2,000 sailors and 60 flag staff officers. The endurance of the Fujian is not yet known, however. The Type 002 carrier Shandong has a top speed of 31 knots and a range of 25,928 kilometers, 16,000 miles, at 14 knots. Similar performance is expected from the Fujian, though top speed is slightly slower at 29 knots. Construction on the Fujian began sometime in the 2010s, though the exact date is currently unknown. Construction was paused briefly as the electromagnetic catapult system was developed, but resumed again in the late 2010s. The ship's modules went into dry dock in mid-2020, and reports were that a launch of the vessel was possible by mid-2022. These reports turned out to be accurate, as the Fujian was launched on 17th of June 2022, sporting the hull number 18. The Electromagnetic Catapult Aircraft Launch System, or EMALS as the US refers to it, utilizes a linear induction motor as opposed to the steam piston catapults of other carriers. This represents a significant technological jump for the Chinese, as they have skipped developing conventional steam-driven catapults altogether. The new system has several advantages over steam piston systems, chief of which are reduced stress on the airframe due to a more uniform acceleration as well as being lightweight easier to maintain, and faster to reset. The development of the EMALS system was spearheaded by China's top naval engineer, Rear Admiral Ma Wei Ming. The new catapult system will allow the launch of larger and heavier aircraft. The aircraft carrier is expected to utilize a modified J-15 fighter variant for its main fighter wing until a dedicated fifth-generation fighter can be developed for carrier-based operations. In 2021, Intelligence analysts concluded that the People's Liberation Army had developed the J-15B, which includes Kato Bar, or Catapult Assisted Takeoff But Arrested Recovery. The new variant also included an upgraded avionics suite, newer engines, and the ability to launch upgraded missiles. The fighter air wing is expected to consist of 55 modified J-15 fighters. The J-15 carries a crew of 1 to 2, depending on variant and mission. It has a length of 22.8 meters, 73 feet and 1 inch, and a wingspan of 15 meters, 49 feet and 3 inches. It has a gross weight of 27,000 kilograms, 59,000 pounds, and a max takeoff weight of 32,500 kilograms, 71,650 pounds. Max speed is reportedly Mach 2.4, with a ferry range of 3,500 kilometers, 2,200 miles. The aircraft reportedly uses two WS-10B turbofan engines. The engines are equipped with afterburners and each produce 30,000 pounds of thrust with afterburners lit. The J-15 is capable of carrying the following ordnance. One GSH-31 30mm cannon with 150 rounds, PL-15 long-range air-to-air missiles, PL-12 medium-range air-to-air missiles, PL-10 short-range air-to-air missiles, YJ-83K anti-ship missiles, KD-88 standoff land attack missiles, YJ-91 anti-radiation missiles, plus assorted bombs and rockets. The aircraft is also capable of utilizing the UPAS-1A buddy refueling pod similar to F-18s in the US carrier fleet. The air wing is also expected to employ prop-powered transport aircraft and KJ-600 AEW and C airborne early warning and control. 
The KG600 was specifically developed to take advantage of the Fujian's upgraded catapult system and will lessen the carrier's reliance on helicopters for AEW and C operations, as well as anti-submarine operations. The aircraft is the direct counterpart to the American E-2 Hawkeye and fills a similar role. The new aircraft made its maiden flight on 29th of August 2020, with flight testing continuing into 2021. The KJ-600 is a high-wing turboprop aircraft fitted with a large overhead radome. It's suspected that the radome houses an Acer-type radar system in a three-way configuration. It has a crew of three to five airmen. It is 18.14 meters long, 59 feet and 6 inches, and has a wingspan of 25 meters, 82 feet. The tailplane is a quad-fin configuration for increased stability. The aircraft is powered by two Zuzu Wojiang 6C turboprop engines each producing 5,103 horsepower. The engines spin six-blade constant-speed feathering props, which are capable of pitching to reverse thrust. The aircraft has a max gross weight of 30,481 kilograms, 67,000 pounds, and an empty weight of 25,401 kilograms, 56,000 pounds. It has a stated range of 1,250 kilometers, 780 miles, and a ferry range of 2,800 kilometers. 1,700 miles. The KG-600 has a max speed of 693 km per hour, 431 miles per hour, and a service ceiling of 15,000 meters, 50,000 feet. It's also possible that the air wing will consist of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, and helicopters. It's anticipated that the air wing will consist of approximately 1,000 airmen. Defensive capabilities are expected to include three 30mm close-in weapon systems, CIWS, these weapon platforms are to be outfitted with Acer radar and are able to intercept anti-ship missiles traveling at Mach 4 Plus with 96% accuracy. It's also believed that the carrier will employ short-range air defense missiles and anti-submarine rocket capabilities. While the Fujian has already been launched, it's not expected to be ready for combat operations until 2024 or 2025. Even still, the Fujian is expected to be the most capable non-US aircraft carrier deployed to date. It represents a giant leap forward for China's Navy, but is it enough to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States? Well, one important factor to consider is how the carrier will be utilized. China does not have much experience in carrier operations. While the United States has the benefit of 100 years of experience, China is in a rush to play catch-up. Launching and recovering aircraft in all weather and lighting conditions is something that takes practice, solid operating procedures, and delicate orchestration. Reports indicate that as of now, Chinese aircraft still utilize land-based airfields precisely because of these shortcomings. They also lack experience in anti-submarine warfare and anti-ship missile detection and engagement. Though the KJ-600 aircraft is being developed to deploy with the Fujian, it's not yet fully operational. Due to the fact that the carrier has conventional propulsion systems, it must cruise with a fuel tanker for sustained operation, exposing yet another vulnerability. Because of these factors, the carrier is likely to be utilized in regional waters in show of force operations, but lacks the experience, technology, and capability for effective and sustained combat operations in distant waters away from mainland resources. This effectively limits its use as a Blue Water Navy flagship in the modern arena. Gerald R. Ford-class supercarriers are the United States' latest carrier class, set to replace the current fleet on a one-for-one -one basis. It's expected that 10 carriers will be built and launched over the course of the upgrade process. It's expected that all 10 carriers will have combat capability by 2040. The first ship, the USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, began construction in 2005, was launched in 2013, and was commissioned in 2017. CVN-78 is replacing the USS Enterprise CVN-65. CVN-78 has a 337-meter flight deck with a 78-meter beam, just slightly larger than the Fujian. It utilizes two nuclear reactors for power and can reach speeds in excess of 30 knots. The nuclear power plant provides the Gerald Ford with an unlimited range. The ship utilizes four electromagnetic catapults as well as an advanced arresting gear system. Displacement with a full combat load is at 100,000 tons and has a complement of 508 officers and 3,789 enlisted men. The air wing employed on CVN-78, CVW-8 or Carrier Air Wing 8 consists of four Super Hornet squadrons, 
an E-2 Hawkeye Squadron, an EA-18 Growler Squadron, C-2A Greyhound Squadron, and two MH-60 Helicopter Squadrons. At the time of this video, there are currently no 5th generation F-35 Lightning II fighters attached to the air wing. However, this capability would not be difficult to add in the future as the F-18 begins to be replaced by the multi-role fighter. The F-18 Super Hornet is a supersonic twin-engine multi-role fighter. It is considered a 4th generation fighter, which puts it in the same class as the J-15B. The Super Hornet has a crew of 1 to 2 depending on variant and mission. It has a length of 18.31 meters, 60 feet and 1.25 inches, and a wingspan of 13.62 meters, 44 feet and 8.5 inches. Max takeoff weight is 29,937 kilograms, 66,000 pounds, and has an empty weight of 14,552 kilograms, 32,000 pounds. The aircraft is capable of reaching 1.6 Mach and is powered by two General Electric F414-400 afterburning turbofans. Each engine is capable of producing 22,000 pounds of thrust with afterburners lit. It has a range of 2,346 kilometers, 1,458 miles, and a combat range of 822 kilometers, 511 miles. The fighter is armed with one 20mm M61A2 Vulcan cannon and 412 rounds of ammunition. It carries four AIM-7 Sparrow missiles, four AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, 12 AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles, and 12 AIM-260 JATM missiles. It can also carry six AGM-65EF Maverick air-to-ground missiles, four AGM-84H KI SLAM ER missiles, six AGM-88 HARM missiles, four AGM-158 JASM missiles, 4 AGM-154 Joint Standoff Weapon JSAO Glide Bombs, 4 AGM-84 Harpoon Anti-Ship Missiles, 4 AGM-158C L Rassam Missiles, JDAM Bombs, Laser Guided Bombs, Mark 80 Series Bombs, and CBU-78 Gator Mine Systems. As far as avionics, the Super Hornet utilizes either the Hughes APG-73 or the Raytheon APG-79 radar systems. It also carries either the Northrop Grumman ITT ALQ-165 self-protection jamming system or the L3 Harris AN-ALQ-214 integrated defensive electronic countermeasure system. The Raytheon AN-ALE-50, BAE AN-ALE-55 tow decoy, Raytheon AN-ALR-67 radar warning receiver, and the MIDS LVT JTRS data link transceiver are also carried. The E-2 Hawkeye is the U.S. Navy's aircraft for AEW and C operations, as well as anti-submarine operations. The Hawkeye is a high-wing, quad-tail, turboprop-powered aircraft. In looking at its physical appearance, you can see where the inspiration for the KJ-600 came from. It also has a large radome affixed above the wing. The aircraft first saw service on 21st October 1960 and has undergone many modifications and refinements since that time in order to meet the needs of the current battlefield. The current model E-2D has aerial refueling capability. It is 17.6 meters, 57 feet, and 8.75 inches long, and has a wingspan of 24.6 meters, 80 feet, and 7 inches. It has a max takeoff weight of 26,082 kilograms, 57,500 pounds, and is powered by two Allison Rolls-Royce T-59A427 turboprop engines. It has a six-hour operational endurance time at sea, allowing sustained command and control operations. The C-2 Greyhound is a transport variant of the same aircraft. It's responsible for carrier onboard delivery COD, operations. CVN-78 hosts a robust defensive weapon suite designed to protect the carrier from multiple avenues of attack. These include two Mark 29 guided missile systems, two Mark 49 guided missile systems, three Phalanx CIWS gun platforms, four Mark 38 25mm machine gun systems, and four M2 50 caliber machine guns. The defensive systems are tied together by upgraded AN Spy 3 X band multifunction radar and AN Spy 4 S band volume search radar. These systems are all tied to the SSDS or Ship Self Defense System. This system has the ability to automate the fire control loop which shortens the response time from detection of a threat to engagement of the threat. The supercarrier also has stealth features, which are designed to reduce its radar cross-section. An additional feature of the carrier is the placement of the island. 
the superstructure which houses the bridge, air traffic control, and command center. The island has been placed aft on the carrier, opening up more space on the flight deck for aircraft to taxi. This change is expected to increase aircraft launch and recovery by nearly 30%. This increased efficiency allows for more sorties to be safely launched than the previous Nimitz-class supercarrier. The US Navy has been operating carriers since 1922, with the launch of CV-1, the USS Langley. With over 100 years' experience, the United States Navy has perfected the intricate ballet that is carrier operations. The current US Navy is capable of carrying out combat operations for extended periods of time before resupply day or night, in all manner of weather. China lacks this experience, however, they have the distinct advantage of trying to emulate the US Navy's operations procedures, technical capabilities, and proficiency. While they are aggressively playing a game of catch-up, at this stage it does not appear that they are at the same level as the United States. First, this is evident in the technological capabilities of the equipment they have deployed. The carrier, while large and technologically advanced as compared to the Type 001 and Type 002 carriers, has some serious shortcomings. It only has three catapults as compared to the Ford's four. It does not have as robust a defensive electronics and weapons suite as the Ford. Perhaps its biggest shortcoming, however, is the propulsion system. Being conventionally powered, it must either cruise with a tanker for blue water operations or remain in regional waters, so the carrier would have to protect both itself and its fuel supply. This is a major blow to its combat capability, so the Fujian is likely to patrol regional waters well within the range of shore-based assets that can offer resupply and tactical assistance. This, combined with the strike group that carriers sail with, would offer enough protection to overcome these shortcomings, but at the expense of global reach. This may be good enough for the Chinese, as they may not necessarily be interested in global reach at this point. As President Nixon once stated, the Chinese tend to be firmly focused on China first. Even at the expense of political doctrine, this is evident when viewing the alliances they hold, as they don't necessarily fall along the lines of political or economic dogma. So, if they are primarily concerned with showcasing military might regionally, then the Type 003 may in fact fit the bill. Having said that, there are other areas that continue to hamper the effective use of the Fujian, beyond the capabilities of the carrier itself. The air wing seems to lag behind the United States in terms of capability and effectiveness. In comparing the J-15 to the F-18E, for example, the United States clearly has an edge. This advantage extends to not only the aircraft's capabilities, but in terms of ordnance carried, mission capabilities, and defensive capabilities. The Super Hornet has had the luxury of time to grow and mature, standing on the shoulders of the original F-18 and the experience gained from the F-14 program. The upgrades are purposeful and well thought out to suit the needs of the Navy and the US Department of Defense as a whole. It would seem that the upgraded J-15 had a less focused development and seems to be more haphazard without a clearly defined role. Sometimes more isn't always better, it's just more. The KJ-600, while very similar in aesthetic to the E-2 Hawkeye, doesn't have the same loitering time and avionics suite. It's true that the Chinese government has kept a tight lid on its capabilities. On the surface, it comes off as a less capable clone. Military technology will only get you so far, however. Tactics and training are often what wins the day. It is in this area where the largest difference between the two carriers and sailors on board is evident. As previously stated, the US Navy has been operating combat-capable aircraft carriers for 100 years. They have seen combat operations in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Middle East, the Balkans. The sailors on board train relentlessly to maintain a state of combat readiness that is based on experience and lessons learned in the high-stakes world of warfare. The Chinese do not share this experience or advantage. No Chinese carrier fleet has actively participated in combat operations. They have simulated strikes on islands. However, they don't have the real-world experience to adequately simulate the pressures of sustained operations where lives are at stake. The PLAN affords the average pilot 100 to 150 hours of flight time annually. US pilots, by contrast, typically fly 200 hours per year. US pilots and sailors are able to conduct combat operations anywhere, at any time, and in all manner of weather. Chinese pilots to date lack this capability. The United States also spends much time and resources training the carrier strike force to operate as a cohesive unit. Through years of experience, procedures, information flow, and command structure, 
have all been carefully crafted to operate globally with extreme effectiveness. It is unknown how much China invests in cohesive combined arms training, but it would have to be overt and extreme to compete with the level of training the US fleet employs. Taking all these considerations into account, it's clear that if we were dealing with a carrier-to-carrier -carrier engagement, absent additional naval and mainland support, things would most likely end badly for the Fujian. However, when adding the support that the Chinese have available regionally, it's interesting to consider what would happen in a regional engagement between the two navies. If one were to conduct a thought experiment into what would happen if China were to take hostile action against Taiwan, we would first have to make some assumptions to get an idea of the playing field. First, let us assume that the Fujian would commence the engagement in the Taiwan Strait. Let's also assume that the Gerald Ford Strike Group was operating independently without support of additional carrier groups. Also, let us make the assumption that additional aircraft would not be provided by the Chinese mainland air force. Finally, let's assume a conventional, non-nuclear conflict where hostilities are already occurring and the rules of engagement allow for the full use of force. It would seem logical that the first order of business would be to establish air superiority and to limit the Fujian's mobility. This would mean removing its tanker from the fight through either subsurface, surface or aerial means. The Ford has approximately 48 strike fighters available and can launch between 160 to 270 sorties a day. The Fujian has 40 strike fighters available, and based on existing figures from the Type 001 and 002 carriers, can launch 20 sorties per day, based on numbers gleaned from training exercises. This vast disparity of flight operations indicates that the Fujian air wing would likely be overwhelmed in actual combat conditions. This simple math does not take into account the early warning detection and electronic warfare capabilities the Ford enjoys. To further exploit the Fujian's weaknesses, the Ford would likely commit to night operations or foul weather operations that would further wreak havoc on the Chinese air wing. With its air wing decimated and an inability to maneuver, the Fujian's contribution to the fight would be marginal at best. From this standpoint, the Fujian seems like a paper tiger, but the reality is that the constraints that we put in our analysis are unlikely to exist in reality. The Chinese mainland forces would be unlikely to allow their fleet to be encircled and besieged. Likewise, the United States is unlikely to enter the fray without the support of allied nations or an additional carrier strike group. It is conceivable that in addition to Taiwan, Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, Thailand and even Vietnam would offer aid if not join the fight outright. The risk of the incident turning into a global conflict is very real and not to be taken lightly. However, even in this scenario, it seems unlikely that the Fujian would come out on top especially if the conflict extended out into what is considered the second island chain. Current analysis seems to indicate that the Fujian serves a political role and a way of flexing regional muscle as a means of intimidating East and Southeast Asian countries, as China continues its effort to expand what it considers its territorial waters, a regional show of force that would augment the man-made islands and the airfields they have placed as footholds in disputed waters. In November of 2023, the Type 002 carrier Shandong and its strike group operated in the Taiwan Strait for two weeks and flew 420 J-15 sorties. This show of force, however, does not likely indicate an imminent threat to Taiwan, but can be used to assess how the Fujian is likely to be utilized. Analysts have also concluded that unlike the United States' use of the Ford as an offensive asset, the Chinese have adopted the Fujian as a defensive asset, specifically as it comes to the first island chain off the coast. China has placed most of its development and deployment on the ability to launch ship-borne cruise missiles. It's likely that the carrier air wing is intended to protect these ships from attack, rather than offensively engaging targets like the United States doctrine. The Department of Defense has indicated that while they do not believe China currently has the capability of successfully invading Taiwan, they may by 2027. This is per testimony presented to Capitol Hill by Admiral Phil Davidson. One thing that is evident is that while that may be the case now, it's not something to be taken for granted. China is aggressively working toward creating a truly capable blue water navy. Ship to ship, China does have the largest navy in the world. They also possess superior industrial capabilities and can build and launch ships twice as fast as the United States. The next carrier in Chinese development is purportedly slated to be nuclear-powered, larger and with a more capable air wing. China is already looking at upgrading the J-15 air wing to a fifth-generation air wing and has successfully test-flown the J-35. 
The J-35 is the Chinese counterpart to the American F-35. We can only hope that the two superpowers never have to engage fleet to fleet. In addition to the catastrophic loss in life that a conflict of this magnitude would create, the economic impact on both countries would be catastrophic. Both countries have economies that are heavily dependent on each other. China owns majority shares in several US-based businesses. These facts make employing the calculus of war tricky, as the United States has never been in an adversarial position quite like this before. Only time will tell how the story will unfold. But what do you think? What would happen if China and the US found themselves in a fleet-to-fleet -fleet confrontation? Who would win? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The mission to build the ultimate weapon is as old as war itself. Driven by a mix of strategic necessity and human curiosity, from the massive Ottoman cannons to the daunting Warwolf trebuchet, nations have historically thrown heaps of resources at creating war machines, some of which border on the bazaar. In the modern chapter of this arms race, China has stepped up as a major contender, though not all of its ventures have hit the mark. Enter the VN-20, China's latest roll of the dice in their ambitious aim to assert dominance over East Asia. Is this colossal machine a stroke of military genius or just a giant leap towards obsolescence? We're diving deep into the heart of China's military evolution, spotlighting its key infantry vehicles and the historical backdrop of its tensions with Taiwan to unravel the VN-20's origins, capabilities and potential pitfalls. This video is more than a review of a new war machine. It's a peek into the future of warfare and a reflection on the motivations behind such massive military investments. But before we get to that, let's talk origin story. And this tanks is filled with war, more war and the death of a leader. At the end of the Second World War, China's nationalistic government fell flat under the weight of economic strain and public unrest. After a bloody civil war that lasted for three years, communist powers flooded the mainland territories and ended imperialism once and for all. Internally, the CCP attempted to hasten China's industrial development with bold but sometimes harmful programs, most disastrously the Great Leap Forward, a policy that led to the deaths of an estimated 20 million people, some sources even cite up to 45 million. Looking over a politically fragmented China, Mao Zedong continued to make efforts to mobilize the country's disorganized military. The most notable of these would begin with the Parcel Island conflict with Vietnam. It was the PLA's first naval clash with a foreign country and a complex joint battle involving the PLA Navy, Marine Corps, PLA Air Force and ground forces, as well as fishermen and militia. The operation, although helpful in the realm of propaganda, with the CCP citing victories over much larger vessels, also revealed to the world that China's military might was not found in their machinery. Like Russia, their greatest strength was how many people were at the government's disposal. However, it wouldn't be long before China would use artillery in modern conflicts. About three years after Mao's death, a self-defensive counterattack on Vietnam showed that China was making a great effort to enter the 20th century. The Chinese attack was conducted along 10 major corridors, primarily against Vietnam's cities of Lai Chau, Lao Cai, and Ha Giang in the western sector, and against Cao Bang and Lang Son in the eastern sector. Nearly every military region in China contributed forces, which included over 20 divisions, about 300,000 troops, 1,000 tanks, and more than 1,500 artillery pieces. Although not a real victory by any means, China was beginning to exhibit its ability to summon immense strength against a foreign adversary. Again, not without setbacks. By the late 1980s, Chinese leadership started dumping massive sums of money into combined arms warfare. One of the major organizations to come out of these efforts was the Central Military Commission, or CMC, heading the People's Liberation Party, People's Armed Police, and the Militia of China, their ancillary Ministry of National Defense, also known as the NDSTIC, was responsible for modernizing the Chinese military, but they struggled to achieve even the simplest goals due to their lack of authority. The only organization with real bureaucratic power was the General Staff Department. It included functionally organized sub-departments for artillery, armored units, engineering, operations, training, intelligence, mobilization, surveying, communications, quartermaster services, and political education works. From here, more departments were formed, making everything bloated and disorganized. Collaborating with allies, China became more like a glorified arms dealer, creating a hodgepodge of aircraft and infantry vehicles that were blatant copies of superior models. An example of this would be a joint fighter jet with Pakistan, the JF-17, 
which ended up being an inferior copy of the F-16. In recent years, China's defense spending only continues to increase. Upgrading their equipment and technologies is a central focus of China's military modernization campaign. From 2010 to 2017, China's annual spending on military equipment rose from $26.2 billion to $63.5 billion. However, when you take a closer look, quantity over quality seems to be the unofficial slogan of the Chinese military-industrial complex. Here's the problem. The Chinese military never seemed to stop the bleeding after the fall of the empire. When it comes to armored vehicles, they have been heavily reliant on two tactics, collaboration and outright theft. Before the Sino-Soviet split, they relied heavily on assistance from their northern neighbors. The Soviet Union gave China 1,837 T-34-85 tanks, which also served with the North Koreans during the Korean War. The 1954 Operations Research Office report of tank versus tank combat in Korea stated that there had been 119 tank duels in the Korean War, including 38 US tanks lost against T-34s. A Sino-Soviet agreement saw the construction of a large manufacturing complex to deliver a copy of the T-54A, which became until the 2000s the Chinese main battle tank, or MBT. When relations soured between the two communist superpowers, China restored to the latter tactic to acquire new technology for enhancement. This can plainly be seen during the Sino-Soviet border conflict in 1969, when a key battle took place on Zhenbao Island, after the Chinese essentially drew first blood, killing 59 soldiers with the initial airstrike, four of the brand new T-62 MBTs were sent to deal with Chinese patrols on the island. According to available records, one of these vehicles was hit and never recovered due to accurate Chinese artillery fire. The acquisition proved instrumental in allowing the Chinese to reverse engineer the latest Soviet technology and devise the next generation of MBTs, the Type 6979. In 1985, China started to gain enough traction to make tanks like the Type 85 with the assistance of Norinco, inspired by the T-72, as a few ex-Iraqi ones captured by Iran were purchased by China for examination. It was the first second-generation Chinese tank. It still fell short of expectations when held up to most other Western tanks, though. This attempt to upgrade the Type 80 by increasing its protection was ultimately a failure, with production stopping by 1995. Moving on to IFVs, it would serve as a discussion to address the Type 86, a ripoff of the Soviet BMP-1. This proved to be a more profitable venture. Many were exported and several variants were also produced. China produced an estimated 3,000-plus Type 86s. About 1,000 were enlisted as of 2009. The Type 86A, the amphibious version of the aforementioned vehicle, has a few practical problems, which is one of the key concerns facing all Chinese IFVs to this very day and it's an obstacle that the country will have to circumvent if they have any hopes of achieving their ultimate goal. This was yet another example of China's reliance on foreign innovation, proving that the country still required outside references to produce effective machinery. Additionally, with strained relations between China and the West, there is little hope for licensing agreements that would help them create tanks capable of meeting optimal standards. This, of course, in conjunction with foreign interests, prevents them from putting an end to a conflict that has now lasted for almost a century. You probably know what we're referring to here. What lies at the heart of many of China's more recent military investments is the increased tensions with Taiwan. Originally, the island was passed from the Japanese over to China at the end of World War II and became part of the Republic on October 25, 1945. Although relations were positive at the start, they started to wobble when leaders like Chen Yi began treating the Taiwanese as outsiders, people corrupted by Japanese culture and policy. Chen hailed from Fujian province and could speak both Minan Taiwanese, and Japanese. He refused to do so, however, believing that the Taiwanese should learn Mandarin, which many of them found difficult. Taiwan, conversely, felt that the mainlanders were carpetbaggers, who were incapable of understanding the society they had built. A riot broke out in 1947, and the following civil unrest was met with extreme violence. Mao Zedong then sent over forces and regained control in 1949. The US gave Taiwan the cold shoulder while these events took place, but the New World superpower changed its tune at the start of the Korean War in 1950. US President Harry S. Truman sent the US 7th Fleet to the Taiwan Strait to prevent an invasion of the island by communist armies from the mainland. Taiwan would be isolated under martial law until 1987. 
By then, they had become a relatively independent state, whose identity, though close to China traditionally, began drifting away to form its own government policies and economic systems. The following decades would see a cyclical rise and fall in China-Taiwan diplomacy. At the moment, analysts are seeing a downward trend following Taiwan's recent economic successes. Indeed, in 2020, for the first time in some 30 years, Taiwan's annual economic growth, a roughly 3% increase in GDP, was greater than that of China. With recent gains, Taiwan increased its defense spending to nearly $17 billion in 2022. The US has become progressively more and more invested in Taiwanese security efforts, contributing $750 million in arms sales. The election of Lai ching tae as president has only widened the gap between the two countries. Prior to the elections, China had labeled Lai as a destroyer of peace because of his ideological commitment to Taiwanese sovereignty. This added strain because China has long publicized its One China mission. Lai has also fired back at accusations stating that the presidential election results represented a victory for the community of democracies and that in the contest between democracy and authoritarianism, Taiwan had chosen to stand on the side of democracy. One could argue that a possible Chinese invasion is still off the table, but recent increased spending, along with China's massive new navy, suggests that conflict is still on the horizon. A series of new Chinese inventions, as well as inexplicable expansion in every branch of the military, continues to send troubling signals to the Western world. Which brings us to the most notable statement China has made in the realm of land-based firepower to date, the new VN-20. First debuted as a seemingly silly tabletop model, at a 2015 arms show in the United Arab Emirates, the VN-20 seemed like an adventurous toy destined to be tossed in a nearby landfill. It was like something a G.I. Joe villain would drive after painting it cobra red. However, in typical Chinese fashion, a prototype was prominently displayed in the middle of a 2022 air show. It wasn't fully fleshed out just yet, but it made the world take it a little more seriously. The logic behind encouraging such a project stems from a model called the VT-4 MBT, a tank that has made its way into the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. It's praised for its chassis, capable of handling large loads. This adaptation has been applied to the VN-20, along with the six road wheels on either side of the hull. Reports state, what Norinco did to build its heavy-duty IFV was employ the same tank chassis and put a new hull on top of it. The resulting VN-20 has the engine relocated to the front of the hull, where its exhaust ports are on the right side. Apparently, this leaves ample room for a sizable weapon station. The technology will prove to be essential for the VN-20, as its weight surpasses any known competitors at 50 tons. This begs the question, what makes this lumbering Goliath so heavy? For starters, the VN-20 stands with a length of 7 meters, a width of 3.5 meters, and a height of 2.4 meters. For the layman, just know that's a whole lot of metal. Next, we have the IFV's armaments. The VN-20 possesses seven total, considerably more than what you'll see anywhere across the map. People are quick to point out that other IFVs carry around three. For the VN-20, these include stacked cannons, with the primary being the 100mm main gun, assisted by a coaxial 30mm cannon, the two HJ-12E anti-tank missile launcher systems, and two RC heavy machine guns. There are two large fuel barrels accompanying the IFV's arsenal above the hydraulic ramp, because this beast is going to require a lot of juice. The next part of the kit that adds so much weight, as expected, is the VN-20's armor. This part of the build is made up of three parts, standard plating, explosive reactive armor, and slat armor. According to available sources, this is where the money is. This slat is designed to withstand explosive projectiles like the RPG with ease. The VN-20 is powered by a 1,300 horsepower diesel engine. Unfortunately, all we know for now is that the power source here is massive, but the specifics behind its construction remain largely unknown. So, why all of these bells and whistles? What can this actually do? Well, it has room for three soldiers to operate weapon systems, along with six dismounted infantry soldiers that can be released from the back during an assault. It can also reportedly take a lot of heat, with Ballistic Protection Level 6 Stanag 4569 against the firing of 30mm APF-SDS. Its stacked cannons are stacked for a reason, providing enough firepower to push through a defensive line full of trenches. This seems like overkill, but firepower like this is quite necessary when fighting an entrenched defense. There really is no other option than to blast your way through the line. 
If this cannon system actually works, it would be a major asset when confronting a heavily fortified line. The two RC heavy machine guns on the tank's rear ensure that there will be no issues if there is an urban attack. These machine guns look like something out of a Bond film, and the internet has been on fire ever since images were released to the public. It's also why Taiwan is a part of this discussion. 80% of the population has been effectively urbanized, so this setup might just indicate that China is working on vehicles capable of withstanding Taiwan's fortified city environment. When it comes to mobility, the VN20 can potentially climb 60% of slopes and vertical obstacles up to 1.2 meters, along with the ability to cross a 2.7 meter long trench. This brings it up to the quality standard seen among Western IFVs. Finally, its guided missile system appears to have a maximum range of 2 to 4,000 meters, depending on the time of day it's used. Depending on who you ask, this huge IFV is either a major threat to security or a big waste of space. Some of the decisions made here have left experts scratching their heads. In truth, there are a fair number of issues with the VN20. Many of these arguably perpetuate the widespread stereotypes revolving around Chinese weapons manufacturing. Before we move on, it's time to bring a number of these issues to light. From top to bottom, let's start with the dimensions of the VN20. Its size alone can be an issue in close combat scenarios. Its mobility is impressive for an IFV of its size, but that doesn't mean you're going to get out of a sticky situation if you find yourself surrounded. War is anything but predictable, and there are plenty of ways to get stuck between a rock and a hard place. This is where one would start to abandon ship, which is where things become even more complicated. We must talk about the placement of the two RC heavy machine guns specifically. If the six dismounted infantry soldiers are forced to make a quick exit, it will probably get a little messy. Exiting a tank is often a death sentence anyway, but in the rare instance where there's room to flee, escaping or casually exiting the VN-20 has some major concerns. Aside from the deafening fire on each side of the hydraulic pump, there is a high possibility that those two large diesel tanks are now leaking profusely not exactly the perfect climate for soldiers needing to run for cover. Bullets fly everywhere, you'd have to be pretty lucky to avoid damage to these reserves. This was one of the primary concerns expressed when the final product was revealed to the public. According to some, this part of the build could be a preemptive psychological move, meaning that a difficult exit may motivate the tank operators to stay in the fight, making them fear running into combat deaf, blind, and soaked in diesel fuel. Honestly, this seems a bit far-fetched, but it wouldn't be the first time communist designs prevented the possibility of fleeing. Next, there's the anti-tank missile launcher, which analysts say most closely resembles the HJ-12E. It will prove to be a sufficient bunker buster with a top attack pattern, however, this delay could be a weak spot if confronted with proper defenses. Countermeasures against ATGMs include newer armors such as spaced, perforated, composite, or explosive reactive armor, jammers like the Russian Shatora, active protection systems like the Israeli Trophy and the Russian Arena, and other methods. Lastly, and perhaps the most obvious obstacle, is the armor and weight the VN-20 must carry into battle. Level 6 Stanag sounds like a fantastic perk when facing a shaped charge warhead, but it's a devastating problem for suspension and general mobility. Differing terrain could cripple the VN-20, and this slat armor might have to be significantly reduced in the coming years, as it probably wouldn't be practical for less predictable invasions. Plus, even though little is known about the IFV engine, most analysts are quick to point out that it doesn't seem to be a reliable source of power for moving so much weight around for prolonged periods of time. If the VN-20 were put out into the field today, it could look more like a deadly NASCAR race, where mechanics would be forced to make repairs throughout each journey. One can't help but think about the German Tiger tank, which struck fear into the hearts of defending armies. It was a powerful product of advanced engineering, but its weight dragged it into the Russian mud, while its underpowered Maybach engine struggled to push its mass through the unforgiving eastern wilderness it had to traverse. Along with this weakness in the tank itself, as briefly referenced in the bureaucratic evolution of the Chinese military, there are a number of elements to address when it comes to the systems meant to supply the necessary manpower and materials capable of mass-producing the largest IFV China has ever designed. In contrast to the West, there is very little standing in the way of extreme projects in countries like China. Most observers of the Chinese Communist Party's recent 20th National Congress agreed on at least one top takeaway. General Secretary Xi Jinping's power is at an all-time high, allowing him to dominate personnel appointments in the top leadership. Even before Xi, there has been a long tradition of unilateral decision-making under the guise of democratic symbolism and parlance. 
It muddies the waters quite a bit, putting outsiders who normally can make solid geopolitical predictions in a position where all they can do is speculate. The only key difference is that recent decades have seen the rise of capitalistic conglomerates given an almost libertarian edge with government-approved monopolies. This can be seen in many different industries across China, especially in the military. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or SIPRI, arms industry database, at least four of China's primary arms companies ranked among the world's top 25 in 2019 based on the value of arms sales. They include Aviation Industry Corporation of China, or AVIC, China Electronics Technology Group Corporation, or CETC, China North Industries Group Corporation, or Norinco, and China South Industries Group Corporation, or GSGC, which ranked 6th, 8th, 9th, and 24th, respectively. Today, we'll just be discussing Norinco, a business established in Beijing in 1980 and the major investor responsible for the VN20. Norinco rivals two key military manufacturing companies in the West, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, raking in about $71 billion each year. With record-breaking revenue and unrestricted innovation, this gives Norinco unmatched flexibility. It should be noted, however, that Norinco is far from being a one-trick pony. The company promotes the commercialization and industrialization of military technology and concentrates resources on developing advanced manufacturing sectors such as auto parts, engineering machinery and equipment, railway products, petrochemical, special chemical, civil explosion, photoelectric information, Baidu applications, intelligent manufacturing, emergency, and modern service sectors such as trade circulation, engineering technology management, and financial services. This is what really separates the company from most of the others mentioned on the list. Beginning with the basics, a lack of competition is rarely a recipe for success. With no real competitors, Norinco builds whatever it wants, but that also means nobody is present to challenge the newest idea. History has shown us time and again that a domestic race to the top is just as, if not more important, as state versus state. The arms industry has always thrived off of a healthy rivalry. That's what makes China's business model so ironic. The country always gives way too much power to a single entity, rendering the rest of the government and privatized businesses to twiddle their thumbs without license to challenge the status quo. Without leadership approval, projects are often neglected, so even the more influential groups hesitate to make anything new. IP protections are also a factor. Even if a company successfully makes a product that works, there's little in place to ensure that they can profit from their creativity in the future. Plus, Norinco has recently been placed in the hot seat for its corrupt business dealings, trading with Russia during one of the deadliest conflicts since World War II. With the way China's government functions, there is little judicial oversight and any inquiries made will not be held to the transparency standards seen in countries like the United States. This is why it was important to highlight China's history leading up to recent events. It proves that the nation has a track record for oversight so ineffective that it borders on the theatrical. Until these weapons are tested on the battlefield, there's no way to prove whether or not these vehicles fulfill promises shared by the foreign press. There's one more thing to mention before bringing this assessment to a close. Is the VN20 a serious threat, or is it simply a publicity stunt that will never get off the ground? According to available information, the answer to this is just as complex as Chinese bureaucracy itself. The United Arab Emirates has reportedly shown interest in placing an order for a number of VN20s when manufacturing begins. This indicates that there will at least be a few roaming the desert in the next decade. That aside, there doesn't appear to be any signs of China building these for their own mounting war effort. Norinco definitely started making this IFE as a way of saying, look what we can do, but introducing the VN20 as the new kid on the block comes with some pretty serious obstacles. For one, China is far from being a leader in the world of precision manufacturing. In fact, for the most part, they are incapable of achieving the bare minimum in this space. While most Western countries have moved on to using sophisticated 3D printing and meticulous crafting tech, China still imports about 71% of their engines and aircraft from better equipped neighbors. This doesn't necessarily mean that China can't evolve in the coming years, but they usually outsource labor to avoid the necessary expenses. If China hypothetically fell into a global war with the West, the trade linking them to the developed world would be severed, and they would find themselves scrambling to catch up with systems that eclipsed them decades ago. President Xi has effectively wiped out all of those capable of challenging him, but this decision has simultaneously poisoned the well. Nobody with proper delegation skills is left to properly turn the tide if such an occasion should arise. 
This means that the mass production of the VN20 is not only unattainable without immense change, but is utterly ridiculous without considerable backing and resources. This leaves one more possibility. China could work with Norinco to export the VN20 to foreign militaries. Many highlight the fact that this is also a futile gesture, as most of China's international consumers are economically stagnant. And yet this might work to their advantage. If you take a look at China's Belt and Road project, they have no problem using debt to expand overseas. A number of African countries are slowly morphing into surveillance states, surrendering their unmined resources in return for debt forgiveness. Upon further inspection, this can be another way of ensuring that they strengthen their position on the African continent, arming governments that have sworn fealty in return for infrastructural improvements. It might just be a theory, but it's currently one of the only avenues China can take if they wish to make Norinco's new monster truly profitable. Whatever the case, given the history of China and its military, the VN20 stands as an embodiment of a century-long quest to make themselves known as well as prove to the world that they have the capacity to compete with the United States and its allies. It acts as the modern equivalent of a war elephant, large and destructive enough to intimidate the less versed opponent, but ultimately incapable of causing serious damage when confronted by an experienced foe. Perhaps that's the point. Only time will tell if the VN20 is a laughable conversation piece or a weapon that will evolve into something truly worth fearing. Now go check out why China's new stealth fighter sucks or click this other video instead. Last year, China's military leadership underwent seismic shifts, leading many on the world stage to wonder if there are deep-rooted issues plaguing the nation's defense forces. Some of these questions were fueled by widespread corruption allegations, over a dozen senior staff officers being let go from their high-ranking positions, and even some suspicious unexplained deaths among the top brass. But while many nations were recently growing concerned over President Xi Jinping's aspirations for invading Taiwan, a bombshell report from Bloomberg has many rethinking China's capability of taking over the populated island. The new details released at the beginning of this year claims Chinese intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, are inoperable, with some allegedly being filled with water instead of propellant. Could these concerns about China's nuclear deterrent readiness be what's been causing trouble for high-ranking officials? Or would this unprecedented purge of China's military be a symptom of the inadequate system? Before examining these latest remarkable claims in detail, let's first learn more about the Chinese People's Liberation Army and what's become known as China's nuclear deterrent triad. The People's Liberation Army, or PLA, is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party and the military force of the People's Republic of China, with over 2,035,000 active personnel split among five service branches – the Ground Force, Navy, Air Force, Rocket Force, and Strategic Support Force. China's military is the largest in the world. But it's been described as massive but sluggish by experts. Sheer size can't compensate for technological advancements, as we've seen recently with the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force PLARF, is the main strategic missile force of the PLA and consists of at least 120,000 personnel. The ARF branch is arguably Xi's favorite, considering the amount of money and manpower put into the branch. It's responsible for controlling nuclear and conventional strategic missiles, and intelligence says it's rapidly expanding. This has caught the eye of many global leaders on the world stage because the ARF ballistic anti-ship missiles are the foundation for China's advanced nuclear counterattack capabilities and their Anti-Access Area Denial or A2AD, system. China is attempting to modernize. How is it faring? United States policymakers and intelligence officials alike have all been historically frustrated and surprised by announcements coming from President Xi and his inner circle. One of the more recent announcements, that Xi has devoted billions of dollars to his aim of transforming the military into a modern force, is among one of many new surprises. One report notes that Xi has specifically pumped billions into buying and developing equipment to build this world-class military by 2050, with Beijing's defense budget growing faster than its economic capacity. With rising global tensions, this decision could end up crippling the machine that made China so wealthy. The crown jewel? The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or ARF, an organization that manages conventional and nuclear missiles. But not everything surrounding the ARF has gone to plan. Many details regarding China's missiles and their nuclear strategies remain unconfirmed by open sources, likely for their own national security reasons. But there are some important facts publicly known about what type of weaponry and capabilities the ARF could have access to. 
China is known to have deployed road mobile ICBMs as part of its nuclear deterrent triad, along with silo-based and submarine-launched capabilities. This nuclear deterrent triad is one that analysts have been trying to better understand and has many on the global stage fearing what a war with China would look like. America has been interested in learning more about each arm of the triad, but more recently the silo-based and road mobile ballistic missile capabilities have been of particular interest. To learn more about these bases, American intelligence officers have started to look to the skies using satellites to learn more. Satellite imagery analysis has identified certain areas in remote western regions of China as potential operating areas for road mobile ICBM units. Each base is given a single identifier, a number from 61 through 67. It's reported that Base 67 serves as the PRC's central nuclear weapons storage facility. The 67th base is located in Baoji City, Shaanxi Province. There are eyes in the sky covering the base, watching for trucks coming in and out and plotting construction transformations over time. More recently, with ARF monetary expansions, analysts are continuing to assess what's changing in the military landscape. Notably, there's a city called Hami, which is located in Xinjiang, in northwestern China. Some analysts have speculated that this general area could potentially host deployment locations or facilities related to China's road mobile ICBM forces. To that end, satellite images shared by the Federation of American Scientists FAS, point to the likelihood of a missile silo field in Hami's deserts. Specifically, there's a 250-foot by 180-foot structure that's been seen from above on July 25, 2021, and matches a similar blueprint to a known missile training site photographed in Jilantai that same year. However, there isn't definitive publicly available information specifically confirming the existence of a major missile field or operating base for ICBMs near Hami, and other experts warn that some of the silos seen by our defense satellites are likely to never be filled with real missiles, but with decoys. Now let's get to the elephant in the room, China's nuclear strategy and no-first-use policy. While this may seem alarming, it's important to note that China's official nuclear policy is described as a self-defensive nuclear strategy, and that historically, China has stored their nuclear warheads separately from their missile launching systems unless there is a heightened level of threat. Their policies would indicate that they're not rushing to pull the trigger on a nuclear war. In 1992, China ratified the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, making it one of five states pledging to not use nuclear weapons as the go-to first weapon under any circumstances. China has pledged to what they call No First Use NFU, meaning they say they will never launch nuclear weapons against any nuclear or non-nuclear nation and to only use them in retaliation if attacked by nuclear weapons. The People's Liberation Army also pledges to deter other adversary countries from leaning toward nuclear options in wartime. This is known as minimum deterrence. China also publicly opposed engaging in a nuclear arms race, and they've even called for a complete prohibition and the thorough destruction of global nuclear weapons. In practice, this translates to the People's Liberation Army maintaining a modest, agile, and diversified nuclear triad. The fact of the matter is that intelligence indicates China's nuclear arsenal remains relatively small compared to what the US and Russia have, which is why China's scarcity, mobility, concealment, and advanced nuclear counterattack capabilities are much higher on America's radar than the bombs themselves. Estimates vary, but intelligence sources indicate that China's total nuclear warhead stockpile is believed to be in the low hundreds. But even with these outwardly ethical practices and self-defense policies, it's no wonder other leaders on the global stage have recently felt heightened fears about wars between China and Taiwan when so little is known about their nuclear triad of road, silo, and submarine launchers. Some of those fears and unanswered questions grew as President Xi's corruption purge at the end of 2023 took place. Here's what happened. More than a decade ago, Xi Jinping set out to clean up his once-corrupt military. A probe into the recent sweeping military purge indicates that there have been efforts to ensnare more than a dozen senior officials in the last six months of 2023. These details indicate that this was China's largest crackdown on the country's military in modern history. The most recent purge came just before the new year. In the last week of December, China's top legislative body unseated nine defense figures, including five top brass members linked to the missile force. Two others were with the Equipment Development Department, which is charged with arming the military. Not even a week before that, China's main political advisory board removed three executives from missile manufacturers. Back in March of 2023, PLA Rocket Force Commander Wei Feng publicly resigned from his post, 
This was a planned departure following a regular duration of his tour, but strangely, he's not been seen publicly since. He wasn't the only official to vanish. Washington Post reporters noted that Chinese Defense Minister Li Shang Fu was last seen in August of 2023 with authorities. He was meeting with higher ups, while US officials said he was about to be removed from his post. Following the meeting, Li Shang Fu hasn't made a public appearance, and on paper, he's been relieved of his duties. On the same day, Dong Jun, a Chinese ex Navy chief with a South China Sea background, was named Li's replacement as Defense Minister. A month before that, in July of 2023, former Foreign Minister Ching Gang was outed from his post in the military, even as he remained absent for over a month. What's even more alarming, Chin was last seen in public on June 25th, seen walking side by side with Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Rudenko, who flew into Beijing to meet with officials. Chin was supposed to meet with EU officials in July, but China suddenly cancelled the talks without explanation. The Chinese military's official newspaper pledged on the first of this year to wage a war on the graft, signaling that more purges could be on the horizon. The purge totals 22 high-profile officials being stripped of their ranks or going missing altogether. What's more alarming, American officials argue, is that these are just the removals and disappearances that Beijing has made public. They point out that the military doesn't typically announce removals or internal investigations, so these public comments and leaked information have raised eyebrows. It's even started to gain traction online. News of Li Shangfu's disappearance got traction on X thanks to a tweet from Ram Emanuel, the US ambassador to Japan. Emmanuel tweeted, President Xi's cabinet lineup is now resembling Agatha Christie's novel and then there were none. First, Foreign Minister Ching Gang goes missing, then Rocket Force commanders go missing, and now Defense Minister Li Shang Fu hasn't been seen in public for two weeks. Who's going to win this unemployment race? China's youth or Xi's cabinet? Some US officials have worried that this purge is indicative of an ideology shift in China's defense and military strategy, but after the Bloomberg report from January of 2024, the newfound intelligence indicates that we may have nothing to worry about. Not even a week into the new year, Bloomberg's investigative journalists uncovered information from US intelligence which states that President Xi's military purge is a direct result of the widespread corruption attempting to undermine his efforts of modernizing the armed forces. Much of this corruption is said to be so concentrated inside the ARF that American officials now believe President Xi is less likely to initiate military action in the coming years. This is major news, considering the world has been holding its breath to see what would happen between China and Taiwan. According to the groundbreaking Bloomberg article, there are allegations that some of China's ICBMs were filled with water instead of actual rocket propellants, but the outlet did not say what sort of missiles have been filled with water or how they came to know that fact. Analysts have taken issue with this claim, noting that even if US intelligence reportedly detected issues with several of China's missiles during transportation and handling, they were likely dealing with their liquid-fueled road mobile DF-41 ICBM. Even if the intelligence reported that the missiles appeared to have been compromised, filled with engineered materials rather than functional rocket fuel, this would simply render the missiles ineffective. In other words, if China was using water as fuel for their missiles, it would be self-sabotaging and destroying the artillery. These defective ICBMs set off alarms within US intelligence about potential quality control problems in China's nuclear forces. The issues are alleged to have prompted the internal purge by Xi, targeting people he must have deemed responsible for the flawed weapons. If this is true, it could undermine China's claims of having an advanced and reliable nuclear deterrent capable of threatening the US homeland. However, the specifics remain classified US intelligence, and China has dismissed such reports as disinformation aimed at maligning its military capabilities. While the Bloomberg's article's claims are explosive if accurate, the article notes they are based on unnamed intelligence sources. The Bloomberg report also did not specify the exact site where the missile silo doors reportedly malfunctioned. China has officially denied the allegations as false propaganda intended to denigrate its military and strategic programs. But how are folks reacting to all of this? America's relationship with China and their growing military has always been a hot-button issue, so it's no wonder experts have been asked to comment on the developing situation. When the original Bloomberg story ran, spokespeople for the White House National Security Council didn't immediately comment. When asked about the US intelligence, Lt. Col. Martin Miners, a Pentagon spokesman, said the Department of Defense's annual China report discusses Xi's efforts to strengthen and accelerate anti-corruption investigations. They didn't provide additional details. Stephen Bryan, who served as a staff director of the Northeast Subcommittee of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as a deputy undersecretary of defense, was skeptical about the theory of using water to replace fuel. 
for an op-ed article posted on January 9, 2024, for the Asia Times, Brian said that the idea that water is substituted for fuel is preposterous. Corrosion-prone rockets are kept empty until needed. Articles about the ICBM DF-5B seem to back up Brian's comments. The corrosive and hazardous nature of the liquid fuel means the missiles are often sitting with empty tanks and are fueled just before launch. Reports even note that if a missile has been filled with fuel ahead of a launch, but the mission is scrubbed, the missile has to have the fuel emptied immediately and have its tanks cleansed with valves and seals replaced. Brian also claims that the intelligence, originally cited by Bloomberg, leads to more major questions than substantial answers, noting that from his background experience, President Xi is trying to cover up something else. Brian believes that water in missiles and silo lids that don't close are smoke and mirrors and that our US intelligence should be really focusing on the generals and ministers being purged from the Chinese military. He asks, would President Xi really reach as far down into the military ranks as he has unless there's a more serious reason? Alfred Wu, an associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, agrees, telling Reuters that analysts should look at the evidence of internal corruption over equipment procurement by the PLA Rocket Force. More heads will roll, Wu said. The purge that centered around the Rocket Force is not over. Yun Sun, the director of the China program at the Stimson Center, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, believes this purge could leave the ARF temporarily weakened. No one with that type of power wants to feel backed into a corner or humiliated on the world stage. The strategic nuclear force is what China relies on as the bottom line of its national security and the last resort on Taiwan, said Sun. It will take some time for China to clean up the mess and restore confidence in the rocket force's competence and trustworthiness. It means for the time being, China is at a weaker spot. Online sleuths seem to have their own theories about what this could all mean. One Redditor suggested that saying the missiles were filled with water is actually a translation error, since in Chinese the word pumping water and exaggerate share the same writing. Similarly, a YouTube commenter shared that Guan Shui literally translates to fill water as a blanket Chinese slang term used to describe replacing any material with cheaper substandard material to increase profit margin. This would again explain why water was specifically brought up in the US intelligence. Another Redditor said that they believe it's possible the top brass who were fired from the ranks had their titles stripped as a result of not being able to procure enough fuel. However, speculation about what happened to the Chinese generals who have been purged has spread like wildfire, with many people speculating that these individuals may not be alive anymore, citing the PLA's emphasis on staying vigilant against graft, citing a battle against corruption in their New Year's Day statement. Developing U.S. intelligence argues that China's ongoing military purge has stemmed from serious equipment issues. These issues, put on blast for the global stage, show Xi's army and the rocket force as China's main nuclear arm, as weak and incapable of carrying out attacks, like the very attacks many fear against Taiwan. To that end, many point to the recent downfall of generals, top brass disappearances, and internal affair investigations as to the real problem, raising questions about whether there's been proper oversight into these massive military investments. These problems will likely dissuade China from risking any military clashes in the near term. But what do you think about China's military modernization? Is China really upgrading, or is it all just numbers and show? Let us know in the comments. Now go and check out why China's man-made military islands are a disaster. Or click this other video instead. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more great military content. China has taken a bold step to protect its interests and gain more influence. It has built massive artificial islands, equipped with military installations and defense capabilities. But as the world looked on, China didn't see the big problem coming that would mess up its plan for more power. Here's what happened. China aims to be the world's leading superpower by the year 2049, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party's victory over the nationalists in the civil war and rise to power on the mainland. Unfortunately for Beijing, China's own geography works against it in achieving this goal. China is surrounded by hostile islands that prevent it from projecting power into the world's oceans and threaten to cut off the shipping its economy relies on. To help mitigate this geographical disadvantage, China has attempted to increase its power in the strategically vital South China Sea, seizing control of disputed islands, rocks and reefs. China has since fortified these areas by creating artificial islands and militarizing them with airfields and hangars, radar stations, anti-aircraft weapons, and ship-killing hardware. The United States and China's neighbors in the region watched this island-building campaign with great alarm. 
marveling at how quickly China built and militarized its islands. However, these artificial islands aren't all they're cracked up to be. In trying to solve one problem, China only created another. Let's just say that these islands might not have the staying power that China needs them to have if it wants to use them as an effective method of power projection in the first island chain. Let's explore the reasons why China built the islands to begin with, why these islands are now in trouble, and why Beijing's ambitions in the South China Sea might sink, literally. The legal origin of the artificial islands comes from China's infamous Nine Dash Line map which it has used to claim 90% of the waters in the South China Sea. Officially, China justifies this claim and the Nine Dash Line with historical anecdotes. For example, China maintains that it and its people had been in the South China Sea since the days of the mythical Xia Dynasty that supposedly began in about the year 2070 BC. Naturally, few people believe these assertions. The historical claims were fig leaves to hide a more cynical, self-interested motive. The South China Sea's waters are economically and geostrategically vital. Economically, the South China Sea has about 15% of the world's total fishing potential, 11 billion barrels of oil, and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. In 2021, 22% of the world's global trade, valued at about $5.3 trillion, passed through the shipping lanes in this area, including 60% of all maritime trade. 40% of the world's petroleum products, and one-third of the world's total shipping. Simply put, whoever controls these waters controls the fates of the countries that rely on this trade. China is one such country. By building its artificial islands and fortifying the area, China can more easily protect its own trade, muscle in on the natural resources in the South China Sea, and exclude the access of other nations, or at least charge them expensive tolls for the use of such resources. Geostrategically, however, the South China Sea is still trapped within the first island chain. To make matters worse for Beijing, these island nations are aligned with China's strategic rival, the United States. Because of the geopolitical alignment, the United States Navy can easily blockade a series of choke points around the South China Sea and disrupt or cut off shipping to the Chinese mainland. The most important of these choke points is the Strait of Malacca, through which China gets a large portion of its energy. In 2016, 16 million barrels of oil and 3.2 million barrels of liquefied natural gas pass through these narrow waters every day, a figure that is likely now higher. China's dependency on the trade that passes through this choke point has been called its Malacca Dilemma, and Beijing has often used this supposed vulnerability as an excuse for its territorial expansion in the area. By building and militarizing islands, China can theoretically bring more ships aircraft and missiles closer to the Strait of Malacca and other hotspots, giving it more leverage over the choke points and making it more costly for the United States Navy to project power into the first island chain. To make a long story short, China wants to seize control of the rocks and reefs in the South China Sea to promote its own self-interest at the expense of other nations like the Philippines, Malaysia and Vietnam, on whose exclusive economic zones Beijing has encroached. A 2016 ruling against Beijing by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, which completely invalidated the Nine Dash Line as a legitimate territorial claim, was simply ignored. As is often the case in international relations, the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. China had expanded its reach into the South China Sea through military means since the 1970s, when it seized control of the Paracel Islands from Vietnam. However, China began its modern campaign in the South China Sea when it seized control of the Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines in 2012. The following year, China started to expand much further. It began building artificial islands in the Spratlys, creating 3,200 new acres of land, militarizing the islands as the years went by. In total, China has 28 outposts in the waters of its supposed Nine Dash Line Map. 20 of these outposts are in the Paracel Islands, an additional 7 are in the Spratlys, and it also has the Scarborough Shoal. The artificial island building campaign centered mostly on the Spratlys. Artificial islands are created by dredging and shifting material from the reefs and seafloor beneath them. Rocks and sand must be pulverized in this process and, naturally, the creation of artificial islands was destructive to the wildlife in the area. Mounds of material needed to be pulverized and moved in the process. The American Admiral Harry Harris, who was commander of the United States Pacific Fleet at the time these constructions were taking place, 
called these artificial islands China's Great Wall of Sand in a speech delivered to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in March 2015. According to an analysis by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, China has reclaimed a total of 13.5 square kilometers of land across the seven reefs it has used in its island-building campaign. China's island-building vessels can dredge up material at impressive rates. Just one of them, the Tianjin Hao, operated by CCCC Tianjin Dredging, can deploy a cutter with the power of 4,200 kilowatts to the seabed. Material is then moved through a pipeline ashore for land reclamation purposes or onto a barge. The Tianjin Hao can deploy its cutter to a depth of 30 meters and extract 4,500 cubic meters of material per hour. Between February and March 2014, this ship was spotted conducting dredging operations in Johnson Reef in the Spratly Islands. This area has now been occupied by China and the reef has since been militarized. Although Johnson Reef is too small to host aircraft, it is armed with anti-aircraft guns and radar systems, contributing to a potential Chinese defense in depth of the area should hostilities break out in the region. CSIS considers Johnson Reef to have been a test run for more sophisticated military structures at more famous and well-armed places like Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subi Reef. The Tianjin Hao was far from the only such ship in China's dredging operations, which can only be described as having been a success. To counter China's Great Wall of Sand island-building campaign, the United States Navy has conducted Freedom of Navigation Operations FONOPS, since 2015. These operations see the close transit of US Navy ships and aircraft around the artificial islands in an attempt to ensure that the South China Sea's shipping lanes stay open. These FONOPs have done little to alter the situation in the South China Sea, however, and numerous close calls between the American and Chinese militaries in the area have led some in Washington to call for them to end. On the flip side, other national security strategists believe that ending the FONOPs and essentially ceding the military prerogative in the area to China would only allow Beijing to entrench itself in the region that much further. Without the United States Navy maintaining a presence in the area, they fear that China's People's Liberation Army Navy would be completely unfettered in asserting its will over the shipping lanes and other countries in the area. Fortunately for the United States and China's weaker regional neighbors, the US Navy might no longer need to do the heavy work alone. Nature itself is assisting in the effort to prevent Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea because the artificial islands are starting to erode and sink. As early as 2019, it became apparent that China's islands were not as stable as Beijing was hoping for. In the first place, China has extended its reputation for often shoddy construction methods to the new islands. The Economist reported that the concrete China used in building the island bases could not cope with the elemental settings in the area. This concrete was instead turning to sponge in such conditions. Additionally, there is vast corruption within China's construction industry. This corruption has extended to China's military ambitions before. For example, in 2019, Su Bo, the overseer of construction for China's Liaoning aircraft carrier, was convicted on corruption charges and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Corruption in the construction industry has often led to substandard work, and the same appears to be the case on many of the artificial islands in the South China Sea. As is often the case, China appears to have cut corners in its construction methods. The concrete which displayed problems was not laid properly on all of the islands. For best results, metal rods should have first been driven into the seabed and then a concrete retaining wall built around the island. This was not always the case, and the structural integrity of some of the islands has begun to erode because of this lack of precaution. For China, speed and cheapness was the priority in these island-building campaigns, which explains why they were built so rapidly. Perhaps international observers should have been a little less alarmed. Much like China's belt and road infrastructure projects and domestic building efforts, quality control was not at the top of the list of priorities in the islands. It also does not help that China has little experience with building structures that would be designed to survive in the type of elements seen in the South China Sea. Beijing made the matter worse and exacerbated its disadvantage by refusing to call in foreign experts for assistance during the island building campaign. The result is that the islands and the infrastructure that make up the bases on top of them were not constructed with top-of-the-line materials. In fact, the islands at Subi Reef, Mischief Reef, and Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratlys were so unstable that fighter jets from the People's Liberation Army Air Force PLAAF, 
had not landed on the airfields there by 2020. This is unlike Woody Island in the Paracels, which China has militarized with a runway capable of supporting the landing of heavy bombers, a feat it had demonstrated in 2018. The lack of use of the runways in the Spratly bases begs the question of why China would choose to build such long structures if they were not going to be used for aircraft. Experts concede that the decision not to land military aircraft there may be seen as a gesture of goodwill to reduce tensions in the region. However, given China's brazen and belligerent stance, this is unlikely. By far the likelier explanation is that the islands are in some way an illusion and cannot support such operations. The weather and climate will also be problems for China going forward. A hit from a powerful typhoon could prove far more devastating to the Chinese constructions than their shoddy concrete. As ocean water warms with a warming global climate, these super typhoons will probably occur in the South China Sea more frequently. China appears to have made no plans for this contingency, however. One super typhoon in the South China Sea hitting in the wrong place might undo all the years of effort Beijing put into its island building campaign. A warming climate causes other difficulties for China's artificial islands. These islands were not built with any sea walls or other protective infrastructure to preserve them against rising waters. However, as the climate warms, glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic melt and add to rising seas. Since 1992, global sea levels have risen by almost 4 inches and continue to rise at a rate of about 0.15 inches per year. NASA predicts that by 2050, sea levels along the American coastline could be 10 to 12 inches higher than they are today, and the more global temperatures warm, the faster the glaciers will melt and the more rapidly the ocean will rise. For example, the ocean rose twice as fast between 2013 and 2022 than it had between 1993 and 2002. Although it's uncertain how far sea levels will rise by the end of the century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that in the best-case scenario, sea levels will rise between 11 and 21.5 inches from now to then. In worst-case scenarios, where competition between states and resurgent nationalism takes priority over environmental concerns, sea levels could rise as high as 40 inches. These sea level rises do not necessarily mean that all coastal communities as they currently exist will need to evacuate. Many communities have seawalls and other defenses. However, China's artificial islands are built at sea level and have no such defenses against erosion and rising waters. China meant the islands to be a string of permanent fortifications in the South China Sea, but it did not build them in a way that would be fit for this purpose. The problem of sea level rise gets worse when one considers that China destroyed vast swathes of coral reef and mangroves in the construction efforts. These structures form a natural barrier against the elements. This is because they break waves and dissipate their energy. Coral reefs allow for sediment to establish itself on the shallow and flat portions of the reef, where mangroves can establish themselves. Once there, the mangroves further break apart the energy of waves and storm surges since the roots and trunks of the trees absorb some of the water. When taken together, these coral reefs and mangroves provide a first line of defense against things like sea level rise and storm surges from typhoons. However, China destroyed these same ecosystems when it began constructing its artificial islands. In an ironic twist that some observers might call a case of poetic justice, China wiped out the very defenses that their islands would have needed to have more staying power in the wake of a warming climate, rising sea levels, and more frequent and powerful typhoons. In 2019, China claimed that it would begin work to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. China's Ministry of Natural Resources said that facilities to protect and recover these reefs had been installed on Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief Reefs. It also said it would survey more areas to identify where coral reefs had been damaged or destroyed and adopt a combination of natural and artificial methods to help the reefs recover themselves. However, China does not exactly have a good track record in this area because in 2015, its State Oceanic Administration claimed that construction of the artificial islands did not alter the health of the Spratly Islands ecosystem. These statements came at the same time that ships like the Tianying Hao were dredging and pulverizing the coral reefs. China also claimed that overfishing and natural causes had damaged the reef long before construction began. With such history, it's little wonder why few trusted China's word in 2019. And about five years later, there is still little evidence that China has meaningfully worked to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. Perhaps as sea levels rise and the risk of severe typhoons increase, Beijing will have no choice but to try to make good on its word out of calculations of self-interest. 
it has invested significant national prestige into its artificial island building campaign and created much bitterness around the world as the price for it. If these islands were to fail in their purpose, Beijing will have wasted a large amount of resources for little gain. However, there is another danger that comes with investing so much to try to shore the artificial islands up. Such investment in some ways defeats the very reason to build fortifications in the first place. The purpose of fortification is not to be an impregnable defense, but to make it more costly for an enemy to project power and to free resources for the builder of the fortification to project power in other theaters. By leaving comparatively few soldiers or weapon systems in a fortification, these assets of military power can be deployed elsewhere where they can be put to better use. However, at the rate the islands are deteriorating and threatened by weather and climate, China might need to continually concentrate resources on saving this great wall of sand, rather than using it as an effective method of statecraft. The fortifications that were supposed to be an aid to Chinese power projection might increasingly become a drain on it as they become more expensive to maintain in terms of money and labor hours spent on them. In some ways, the problems facing the artificial islands in the South China Sea were predictable, as they follow a historical pattern concerning China. China is and always has been a colossus of a nation. However, it also has a history of not being able to live up to its full potential. For example, it was the wealthiest country in the world even into the 19th century. But despite this, it was unable to effectively use this advantage to compete with the Western powers and Japan. Now history might be repeating itself. China is again a wealthy and powerful nation, but it is increasingly plagued with problems that might not permit it to achieve the full potential of its recovered status on the world stage. The expansion in the South China Sea has mirrored this age-old conundrum for Beijing. At first, it appeared the island-building campaign would solidify its place on the road to hegemony in the area. But through alienation of its neighbors, poor planning and shoddy construction, these edifices might be the latest example of history repeating itself, with China not being able to take advantage of its latent potential. The islands were supposed to be a signal to the world that China was back, rejuvenated, as Xi Jinping might say. But if they sink, it will be a signal of another sort. There is no doubt that the artificial islands succeeded in accomplishing China's short-term goals for the South China Sea. However, the game of nations is always a marathon and not a sprint. If the islands cannot stay for the long haul, they will cost China far more than they have gained for it. But what do you think about China's artificial islands in the South China Sea? Do you think they will have the staying power and can be an effective method of power projection for China in the future? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. And also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. How do we really know what's powerful and what's just show? This question gets pretty interesting when you look at China's military growth under Xi Jinping since 2013. They're now rolling with the world's second biggest military budget and might even spend 4% of their GDP on defense. For a somewhat overlooked military force in the 2000s, China has jumped up to having the biggest navy around, complete with modern aircraft carriers and a bunch of high-tech gear. But here's the thing, is China's military muscle as strong as it looks, or is it overhyped? Could it be more of a paper tiger than a real powerhouse? In this video, we're going to dig into these questions and try to figure out what China's military is really made of. Russia's invasion of Ukraine naturally prompted a second look at the supposedly new and improved Chinese military. For years under Putin's rule, Western experts feared the supposedly modern military Moscow was building, only to find that it stumbled forward in Ukraine through sheer mass, taking hundreds of thousands of casualties in exchange for minimal territorial gains over two years. Could something similar be at work in China? Was it another example of an authoritarian country trying to look stronger than it really was? Modernizing China's military has been one of Xi Jinping's top priorities since taking power, but over the second half of 2023, he still saw the necessity of going through another purge. Nine generals from the People's Liberation Army were fired. Three of those were serving in the PLA's prized rocket force, which oversees China's vast stockpile of conventional missiles and its nuclear arsenal. Another of the sacked officers was the naval commander responsible for the South China Sea, even China's defense minister, Li Shangfu, was fired and replaced. Other sacked officers were responsible for procurement of supplies. Military equipment suppliers have also been on the chopping block. Neither Xi nor sources close to him have given a reason for the purge, but as early as December 30th, analysts guessed that it involved corruption over the acquisition of military equipment. 
As we've seen in Ukraine, such centers of corruption will prove disastrous for a fighting force in the field. Perhaps it shouldn't be surprising that Xi became so concerned. In January 2024, some of the clouds began to lift. American intelligence sources revealed that China's rocket force had taken to fielding missiles filled with water rather than fuel, and that some of the country's silos were constructed with improper lids, which would prevent missiles stored in them from being launched. To make matters worse for the Chinese military, US intelligence suggested that corruption in the rocket force and the broader PLA was so damaging that Xi would need to recalculate whether China would be able to make any military moves in the foreseeable future. In its official New Year's Day statement released in Mandarin, the PLA said it was in a battle against corruption and reminded its personnel to stay vigilant. The reports from American intelligence did not state which missiles have been filled with water, but either way, the PLA rocket force's prestige has taken a big blow, which is dangerous for China. Much of its military buildup and approach to deterrence has involved the acquisition of thousands of ballistic and cruise missiles as part of its anti-access area denial strategy for a confrontation with the United States. If it cannot effectively carry out this strategy, it cannot contest the US military around the First Island chain. Tom Sugart, a former officer in the US Navy, now with the Center for a New American Strategy, accurately called the rocket force China's crown jewel and a center of gravity for the Chinese military. For China, this is the force that must be the most effective in carrying out its mission, and yet it might be one of the centers of corruption. Yao Cheng, a former lieutenant colonel with the PLAAF who defected to the United States in 2016, discussed the extent of corruption in the Chinese military with Radio Free Asia after the recent reports emerged. The budget for dinners and gifts is taken from the equipment department. Some military departments have no money, and if they need money, their chief has to allocate some from the equipment budget. The equipment budget would have been sufficient, but not after being misappropriated. When I was in the military, we would drain fuel from aircraft fuel tanks for cooking, which burns green and has no smell at all. When we would eat hot pot, we would take out the solid fuel in the missiles piece by piece because there were insufficient supplies. I would often go along to the armory and ask them for a small round piece of solid fuel when we wanted to have hot pot. Unfortunately for China, the problems in its military go far deeper than its vaunted rocket force. China's new navy is another item of pride for its military. Under Xi, China has steadily grown to a relative level of sea power that it has arguably not seen since the days of the Ming treasure fleets under Zheng He in the 15th century. China now has the world's largest navy by number of vessels, with 426 units in its fleet as of January 2024. Among these are three aircraft carriers, the Liaoning, the Shandong, and the Fujian. The Fujian is a step above the other two, as it's the first Chinese aircraft carrier to use a catapult system, which allows its planes to be launched faster than the ski jump system used on its other carriers, which are based on Russian designs. The Liaoning is in fact the sister ship of Russia's troubled Admiral Kuznetsov aircraft carrier. The Fujian is only the second ship in the world to have an electromagnetic catapult coming after the USS Gerald R. Ford. This is a big step forward because traditional steam catapults require more maintenance than an electromagnetic one. The Fujian's arrival was therefore a symbol to both China and the wider world about its growing naval capabilities. Although the new aircraft carriers represent a significant improvement in China's navy, they are not all they're cracked up to be. The aircraft carrier is useless unless there are planes to fly from it. This is a problem for the PLAN, as China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators. As a sign of its commitment to naval aviation, China established the Naval Aeronautical University in Yantai in its Shandong province in 2017. The new institution meant that the PLAN would be emphasizing training naval pilots on its own, rather than continuing with the previous practice of picking them out of the PLAAF's ranks. Unfortunately for Beijing, China's lack of institutional experience has been quick to show itself, and the new institution has lacked the necessary equipment to bring it up to par with American standards. One of China's biggest problems is that it lacks a plane dedicated to training aviators in taking off and landing on a carrier. The current plane for this purpose is the JL-9G, which was first unveiled in 2011. This plane can't be used to simulate emergency landings on a carrier because it flies too slowly and because the plane itself is too light. Because of these design flaws, China's would-be naval aviators are limited to training on land-based simulated carriers. China has only one carrier-based fighter, the Shenyang J-15 Flying Shark, but only about 60 of them have been built. 
It's also a much heavier aircraft than the JL-9G, with an empty weight of 17.5 tons, compared to the JL-9G's 7.8. The J-15 has a top speed of Mach 2.4, compared to the JL-9G's Mach 1.05. The differences between the two planes make China's current training regimen less than ideal for fielding pilots for the PLAN. The result is that China has had a tough time fielding a roster of 200 pilots to operate 130 aircraft for its aircraft carriers. The Fujian in particular has another problem. Although it resembles American aircraft carriers in some important ways, its insides are much different. Unlike them, it's not powered by nuclear propulsion. Instead, the Fujian is powered by steam turbines and boilers. As a result, the Fujian lacks the range and operational durability of its American rivals. It will not be able to stay at sea as long as they can. This is less of a problem when China expects a confrontation to take place close to its home waters. However, Xi Jinping has made building a world-class military by the middle of the century one of his highest priorities. For greater power projection, capable of competing with the United States on a global level, the Fujian falls short, even if it could adequately staff its pilots and aircraft roster. The weaknesses in the Fujian and China's previous two aircraft carriers are partly why efforts are underway to build a fourth aircraft carrier, the Type 004. This one will be nuclear-powered. In late 2023 and early 2024, the Fujian began its sea trials, signaling that it was almost ready for frontline service. In February 2024, China was seen testing an unspecified carrier-based aircraft that a few observers have called the J-35, which would be China's second, fifth-generation aircraft. We will need to wait and see how this plane could change the situation. Even so, China still lags significantly behind the United States in naval aviation experience, and that is a gap harder to fill than the number of aircraft carriers. China has also made significant improvements to its air force in the past 10 to 15 years. Prior to that, it was often operating obsolete second-generation aircraft. This is no longer the case, with the PLAAF now relying on the fourth-generation J-10 and J-16 and the fifth-generation Chengdu J-20 Mighty Dragon. The J-20 in particular is an item of pride for the Chinese brass. It's the third, fifth-generation aircraft to be produced in significant numbers. American war planners respect it enough to make giving the F-35 its Block 4 upgrades a high priority. One expert said that he thought a contest between the current F-35 and J-20 would be uncomfortably close. The J-20 had its maiden flight in 2011, came into service in 2017, and recently got a new engine, the domestically produced WS-15, which is expected to enter service in 2025. It had previously used the Russian-made AL-31 engine, developed for the fourth-generation Su-34, which limited its capabilities. The new engine is expected to allow the J-20 to fly at supersonic speed without afterburners for extended durations and to provide greater thrust and maneuverability. Aviation experts expect the WS-15 to make the J-20 the world's leading aircraft in thrust output until sixth-generation fighters like America's NGAD arrive on the scene. The J-20 has other formidable capabilities. It can engage targets from beyond visual range, as it comes armed with long-range missiles like the 200km PL-15 and the purported 300km PL-21. The J-20's exact radar system is unknown, but it is believed to be an AESA radar that possibly features stolen technology from the F-35. Like the Lightning II, the J-20 mounts electro-optical and infrared sensors on its frame to provide 360-degree coverage for sensor fusion and can likely share this data with friendly assets elsewhere. If so, there is potential for the J-20 to act as an airborne early warning and command and control plane, leaving out the need for specialized large and slow aircraft to perform this purpose. Despite the J-20s being a clear advancement in China's domestic aviation and arms industries, even some Chinese experts say their new plane is not up to America's best fighters. One analyst in Beijing's Wan Wang security think tank mentioned that the F-35's XA-100 engine is at least a decade ahead of the WS-15. Some international aviation experts report that the J-20 lacks maneuverability, which would make it vulnerable in a dogfight with enemy fighters. Others disagree, but this is of secondary importance. The worst thing is that some aviation experts also question whether the J-20 is a true fifth-generation aircraft, a true stealth fighter. While acknowledged as being stealthier than Russia's Su-57 Felon, 
The F-22 and F-35 likely have significantly lower radar cross-sections than the J-20, which would give them a big advantage in a confrontation. Like the Su-57, the J-20 has its highest performing stealth features concentrated in the front of the plane, while comparatively lacking from the sides and rear. This might be fine if the J-20 approaches its targets from the front, but if it needs to turn or maneuver, it is likely significantly more visible and imperiled. In contrast, the F-35 reportedly has the radar cross-section of a metal golf ball at about 0.001 square meters. If so, this would likely give the F-35 an advantage between one and two orders of magnitude in stealth compared to the J-20. The F-22 would also be stealthier than the J-20 on this assessment, although the USAF brass acknowledged it is less stealthy than the F-35. The J-20's radar, while an advancement, is also not all it's cracked up to be. Because the J-20 began with the JXX program of the 1990s, its radar is an early Chinese AESA radar. Although this is a big step up compared to China's previous fighter aircraft and likely gives the J-20 enhanced situational awareness and detection against targets with low cross-sections, it's still hard-pressed to match the F-35's ANAPG-81, much less the coming ANAPG-85, and likely can't replicate the F-35's flying supercomputer attributes. Although we cannot know for certain unless we see an actual confrontation, it's likely that America's fifth-generation fighters will be able to avoid detection and shoot the J-20 down before it can spot them. The J-20 is also probably at a disadvantage against the F-22 in a dogfight. China's newest bomber may have more unrealistic claims. Since China has tried to evolve its military into one capable of strategic power projection rather than a fighting force more suited to defense, it has also seen a need to upgrade its bomber force. In 2016, it revealed a new bomber, the Xian H-20, which it sought to be an answer to America's stealth bombers, the B-2 and coming B-21, and the final piece of its nuclear triad. Initial reports suggested that the H-20 would have a range of 10,000 kilometers. This is a range greater than the B-2 and one which would put all American and Allied targets in the Indo-Pacific region in danger. It could also put Hawaii in danger, and if the bomber took an Arctic flight route, such a range would be sufficient to reach the 49 other states, that is, without aerial refueling. The H-20 has other reportedly impressive features. It may be able to carry a payload between 10 and 20 tons, in line with the B-2's A-10. Chinese sources claim that the payload will far exceed the B-2 with a 45-ton limit. The new bomber will also supposedly carry four stealth or hypersonic missiles. The H-20 seems to be a plane designed for deep penetration missions, relying on stealth features rather than speed or maneuverability to get within an enemy's air defense zone. The bomber's exterior appears to have a stealth design with a blended wing body, embedded engine, and lack of vertical structures. The fact that this purported design looks like a knockoff of the B-2 reveals China's intentions for it. It should also come with a new AESA radar to better identify threats and high-priority targets and for improved electronic warfare attributes. The H-20, if it were to come online, would be a big improvement over China's current go-to bomber, the X-6, which is based on the Soviet Tu-16 Badger that originated in the early 1950s. But there are problems for Beijing. One of them is that this bomber has yet to fly and seems to be behind schedule. In July 2022, Chinese media sources reported that the H-20 was close to ready for its maiden flight. This has still not occurred as of February 2024. Plans are in place for the bomber to be operational before the end of the decade, but China has yet to even publicly unveil it. The most anyone has seen of it is on two videos. The first was a 2018 video released by the H-20's manufacturer, the Aviation Industry Corporation of China AVIC. The footage revealed an airplane underneath a large drape. The second came in a PLAAF recruiting ad in 2021, which revealed a previously unknown flying wing-type aircraft reflected on the visor of a pilot. Perhaps there are reasons for its lack of a maiden flight. A plane with the H-20's purported wing design would need to be much larger than thought in order to carry a 45-ton payload. Meanwhile, to carry its large payload over its supposed long range, the H-20 would need to carry much more fuel than a typical bomber. When reporting on the H-20 in its assessment of Chinese air power in 2020, the Pentagon believed it would have more modest features, such as an 8,500km range and a 10-ton payload. The Pentagon concedes that the H-20 is a significant leap from China's current bomber capability, but believes that the claims some have made of it are too unrealistic. 
In terms of stealth, the H-20 will be much less detectable than China's traditional bombers. However, its design may not be as good as the B-2 or B-21. The bomber may be able to adjust its wings from angled to straight in order to improve its stealth. If not, the angled protrusion will make it less stealthy. Even the presence of an adjustable seam for the wings would make the plane more detectable than if it had a smooth design. The wing configuration, while a leap forward, still suggests that China is learning when it comes to engineering stealth aircraft. There is no doubt that China's military has come a long way in the past 25 years, particularly in the past 10 under Xi Jinping. It's closed the gap in capability with the United States, but its problems only reveal how far behind it was to begin with. China still lacks experience in creating a combined arms military with cutting-edge technology. It would be dangerous to assume that most of China's missiles are filled with water, as we saw what its rocket force, air force, and navy are capable of in exercises off Taiwan in 2022 and 23. However, as recent events have made clear, China's military also suffers from internal problems. Corruption will likely continue within the PLA's ranks. Though the pay structure has improved, officers are still not paid well, and military expenditures lack transparency. Realities like this make double timing a natural response. China's long-term demographic problems will also pose a problem for its military. With an aging population, it will have increasing difficulties in recruiting new personnel. The PLA has presented a bold and aggressive new face to the world, but behind the facade, it still has many shortcomings if it plans on challenging the US military for global dominance, as Xi Jinping wants it to do. What do you think about China's supposed latest and greatest gear and the corruption scandal that broke out between late 2023 and early 24? What else might China be hyping, and what other problems might Xi Jinping's China dream have in manifesting into reality? Don't forget to let us know your thoughts in the comments, and make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. China and the US have amassed incredible armies that are stocked with the best equipment and weapons that money can buy. But whether there will actually be a shooting war between them remains to be seen. The main question on everyone's minds is, who would win if there was such a war? Both sides are extremely impressive on paper, but what they bring to the fight varies in quality. What kind of short-range and long-range weapons do they possess? Whose snipers are deadlier and what are they armed with? How do both countries' main battle tanks stack up against each other? What about air force and naval power and more non-traditional ways of fighting like cyber warfare? And of course, we can't overlook the ultimate game-changer, nuclear capabilities. Who has the edge when it comes to weapons, China or the United States? Let's dive in. More often than not, wars are not won by missiles or satellites. They are won by men on the ground who are willing to commit acts of extreme violence in order to bring victory for their side. Going into battle, you want your troops to be outfitted with the best weapons they can have. It's the same story now as it was with the Greek hoplites and Roman legionnaires. So what are the US and Chinese troops on the ground armed with? Starting with the US, the main battle rifle that the ground troops of the US Army and US Marine Corps are armed with is the M4 M4A1 carbine. It should be noted that the US military is currently in the process of replacing the M4 with the Sig Sauer XM7, which boasts a lot of improvements over its predecessor but is being rolled out and tested slowly. So, as of this video's production, the US military's main battle rifle is still the M4 M4A1. But what sets the M4 apart as such a standout weapon? The M4 has been the US military's bread and butter for over two decades. Battle-tested in the streets of Iraq, the hills of Afghanistan, and many other countless places around the world, it's proved time and again to be reliable, accurate, and deadly. Shooting a 5.56mm round from a 30-round magazine, the M4 is a lightweight carbine that's gas-operated, air-cooled, and magazine-fed. Weighing in at 25 kilograms when fully loaded, it's light enough to be carried into combat with a full pack. But that's not all. It also features a selective fire rate and collapsible stock, with an effective firing range of 600 meters and a maximum cyclic fire rate of 970 rounds a minute. The M4 allows the shooter to be efficient and accurate in both short- and long-range situations. While the M4 is a favorite among soldiers and marines, it isn't without its problems. Since it uses the gases expelled from the previous round to put the next one into place, after a while it can overheat and jam or misfire. Not great in a combat situation. Soldiers also noted that the aluminium magazines can dent rather easily and not function properly. 
They also said that when fighting in places with lots of sand, aka Iraq, the M4 requires near-constant cleaning and maintenance to stay in fighting shape. However, its next-generation variant, the M4A1, sought to build on its predecessor and features a fully automatic fire rate, a more constant trigger pull, steel or polymer magazines, and a heavier barrel for improved accuracy and durability. Turning our gaze to the PLA, what's their weapon of choice, and how does it stack up against the M4A1? Enter the QBZ-95, born from the shortcomings of its predecessors. In 1991, the Gulf War kicked off and was almost over as quickly as it started. Coalition forces from the United States and other countries absolutely demolished the Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein, many of whom had been using Chinese-made weapons. This defeat was so decisive that the Chinese generals in the PLA began to plan for their own future. Recognizing that their current battle rifles, the Type 68 and Type 56, were quickly becoming outdated, so they strove to create something new. Introduced in 1997, it is a gas-operated, rotating bolt assault rifle with a bulb-up design, meaning that the clip is behind the trigger. Part of the unique design is the striker firing mechanism. This mechanism makes it so the hammer, firing pin, and bolt are all in one piece. While this allows for easier cleaning and maintenance, it's also brought on some mechanical problems with the rifle. The QBZ-95 weighs in at around 2.9 kilograms when fully loaded and also has a 30-round capacity magazine like the M4. It has an effective range of about 400 meters and shoots at a cyclic rate of 650 rounds per minute. With selective fire available, the QBZ-95 is a versatile rifle capable of handling any situation. The QBZ-95 also has a couple of variants, including a light machine gun and a carbine. The QBZ-95 shoots a round unique to the Chinese military with specifications listed at 5.8 by 42 mm. It allegedly has an advantage over traditional 5.56 ammunition because it has a greater energy output due to it being heavier than the 5.56. The 5.8 has 77 grains of gunpowder compared to 63 in the 5.56. China keeps this information about this ammunition pretty secret, so there aren't a ton of reports out there about it. Sounds a little scary, but on the other hand, China also has not fought a serious war since 1979, so the 5.8x42mm round has not undergone extensive testing in combat either. Some of the known disadvantages are clunky magazine insertion due to its bulb-up design, and its selective fire switch is in an awkward position as well. Overall, the QBZ-95 is a capable and lethal battle rifle when in the right hands, but time will tell how well it fares in the prolonged heat of battle. When comparing these two, it's quite difficult, as we do not have the same level of technical information about the QBZ-95 as we do the M4, nor do we have years of battlefield experience to look to. We'll give the edge to the M4 here, with its slightly better range, fire rate, and tried and true field experience. Moving a little higher up the food chain, we have light machine guns. As mentioned when discussing the M4, the US military is in a transition period when it comes to its squad-level firearms. The M249 Squad automatic weapon is slowly being phased out in favor of the new XM250 from Sig Sauer. Since it's not yet in widespread use, we'll focus on the workhorse of the US military, the M249. The M249 Squad Automatic Weapon, or SAW, is a gas-operated, portable, belt-fed machine gun that fires the standard NATO round of 5.56. The operator can engage targets out to 800 meters and comes equipped with either 30-round magazines or 200-round boxes of belt-fed rounds. With a fire rate of up to 800 rounds a minute, the SAW comes equipped with a quick-change feature for the barrel. This allows the gunner to keep a solid rate of fire without having to wait for the barrel to cool down. Seeing extensive use in Iraq and Afghanistan, the SAW has rained down typhoons of lead on insurgents for decades now. While it certainly has positives and performed well on the battlefield, it also has shortcomings. Troops often found the SAW heavy and clunky when maneuvering in combat. At 41 inches in length and 22 pounds when fully loaded, the SAW can become cumbersome during firefights or over long stretches of movement. In addition to this, there have been some concerns as to the accuracy of the SAW at extended ranges past 500 yards. Because of this, the US Marine Corps has replaced the SAW with the M27 Infantry Automatic Rifle IAR, which is magazine-fed and shoots the same caliber as the SAW but has a much better accuracy and is lighter to carry. Another complaint about the SAW was that its 5.56 round was becoming outdated with continuing innovations in body armor technology. As body armor gets tougher, the 5.56 isn't as powerful as it used to be. This issue is being fixed with the next-generation light machine gun the army is rolling out, the Sig Sauer XM250. 
the XM250 shoots a .277 Fury, which is smaller in size to a 7.62 round, guaranteed to pack a bigger punch than the 5.56. So as the US military shifts away from the saw, they will see some major advantages on the battlefields of the future. Switching gears and looking at the Chinese version, the QJS-161. Lightweight, accurate and versatile, the 161 is a great light machine gun. Introduced in 2022 and steadily rolled out to the PLA troops, the QJS-161 is gas-operated and utilizes an open-bolt design. It shoots the Chinese-made 5.8x42mm round, the same as the QBZ-95, but the rounds are carried in a fabric container which helps keep the overall weight down considerably. The fabric container is also an improvement over older models' drum magazines, which were heavier and more prone to jam. When empty, the 161 weighs in at only 11 pounds. This lightweight design is a considerable advantage over the saw. There's not much data on the performance and ballistics of this gun yet, due to it being fairly new and the Chinese tendency towards secrecy in matters such as this. Overall, we'll give the advantage here to the 161, as it's much more lightweight and maneuverable than the saw, although it seems pretty clear that in the near future, the M27 and XM250 might become equal or even surpass it. Now, any ground force needs both short-range and long-range weapons. Snipers have become a key asset on modern battlefields, both for the damage they can cause the enemy physically and psychologically, but also for their ability to gather intelligence. The US military uses a variety of rifles with its snipers, but we're going to focus on the Barrett MK-22 PSR, as it's currently in use by the United States Army and Marine Corps. This weapon comes with a lot of varieties in barrel length, weight, and even the caliber it can shoot, weighing between 13 and 15 pounds, and with an overall length between 42 and 49 inches, the rifle can be customized to meet the needs of the mission. In addition to this, the stock is collapsible and the suppression system is removable, making it even more compact when needed. This will be especially useful for airborne troops and special operators, as they will have a rifle ready for every type of combat environment. In addition to this, the bolt-action rifle can be adapted to fire a variety of calibers from its 10-round magazine, including the NATO standard 7.62, 0.300 Norma Magnum, 0.338 Norma Magnum, 0.300 Win Mag, and others. Its maximum effective range comes in just under a mile at 1,600 yards. While this rifle has undergone extensive testing by all branches that will use it, it's yet to see significant combat use. Nevertheless, the precise and deadly rifle will be a terror on the battlefields of the future for years to come. Looking at the PLA arsenal, their snipers are equipped with a few different sniper rifles, but one of their main ones is the CSLR-35, military designation QBU-202 and QBU-203. Weighing in between 14 and 16 pounds, and between 47 and 51 inches in length, the CSLR-35 is a superb example of a modern sniper rifle. There are multiple variants of this rifle with different modifications, and it can even shoot two different calibers, the 7.62x51mm NATO or 8.6x70mm .338 Lapua Magnum. With an effective range between 1300 and 1600 yards depending on the caliber and a folding stock, the CSLR-35 should more than cover the needs of an infantry platoon or special forces unit. Like its US counterpart, the CSLR-35 is fairly new and has yet to see any combat, so given this and the similarities between the two, we'll call it a tie. Moving up the food chain of death and destruction again, we find ourselves at anti-tank weapons. Anti-tank weapons have been around since there were tanks to shoot at. Beginning in World War I, people needed a way to knock out the armored behemoths prowling the battlefield and used whatever was at their disposal, and that usually meant grenades or some kind of improvised explosive device. From World War II onward, we saw shoulder-mounted rocket launchers being used against tanks, and since that shift, the strategy has been much the same. Modern militaries today utilize both guided and unguided anti-tank rockets. For our purposes, we're going to look at the guided rockets as they're more advanced. Let's first take a look at one of Uncle Sam's most effective inventions, the feared and respected Javelin. The FGM-148 Javelin, or Advanced Anti-Tank Weapon System Medium awesome, is an American-made man-portable anti-tank system. It was first produced in 1996 and has seen extensive combat in the global war on terror. In recent years, it has been on the front lines with Ukrainian forces as they battle back against Russian armor. It's been a key asset for them as it's helped knock out countless Russian tanks and armored vehicles. It is what they call a fire-and-forget launcher, as after the operator fires the rocket, they do not have to do anything else for it to strike the target. The rocket will lock on and guide itself there. 
The warhead itself is a high explosive anti tank warhead, or HEAT, and is capable of taking down modern armor using a top down attack, meaning that the warhead strikes the tank where the armor is typically the thinnest, on the top. It can also be used to take out buildings or other fortifications using a frontal attack. The javelin, when ready to fire, weighs about 50 pounds, so it's not something you can just casually carry around in the middle of a firefight. You have to move with a purpose. Able to be fired by just one person, it's an extremely valuable tool when it comes to anti-armor. Just talk to some of the Ukrainian soldiers. It has an incredibly impressive range of fire, with 2,500 meters being the standard, but under favorable conditions, it's even been successfully tested at a range of 4,700 meters. Now, while this is extremely impressive, it's not a given that this could be achieved in combat. Either way, it's a formidable weapon that will be used on many battlefields around the world. Looking at what the PLA has to offer, they have what is essentially a copy of the Javelin. Developed in 2014 and distributed to PLA units in 2021, the HJ-12 is basically just a Chinese-made version of the Javelin. It's capable of all the same things, is operated the same as well, and even weighs the same. In terms of range, they are very similar too. The only real difference comes with the diameter of the tube itself. The Javelin has a diameter of 114mm and the HJ-12 has a diameter of 135mm. This means that the HJ-12 is likely to be able to fire a heavier warhead, capable of greater destructive power. For that reason alone, we'll give the advantage here to the HJ-12. While squad-level weapons are great in a firefight and often can handle whatever is thrown at them, sometimes you need to bring in a heavyweight fighter, that being armor. Tanks have been around in some form or another since the early 20th century, seeing their first combat use in World War I. The main US battle tank is the M1 Abrams, and it's seen combat consistently since the 90s. Even now, shipments of Abrams tanks are being sent to the besieged Ukrainian forces. The Abrams is 26 feet long, not counting the gun barrel, and has a width of 12 feet. The Abrams is one of the heaviest tanks in service, weighing over 70 tons. It boasts a variety of features that make it the incredible fighting machine it is, including a multi fuel turbine engine, Cobham composite armor with upgraded models even having depleted uranium, a computer-controlled fire system, as well as multiple improvements for crew safety. In terms of weaponry, the later models are now equipped with a 105mm cannon and multiple 50 caliber machine guns. The cannon has an effective range of between 3,000 and 4,000 meters. The depleted uranium being added to the later models drastically increased the overall weight of the tank, as well as also increasing the protection. Additional upgrades over the years have seen reactive armor added as well. The Type 99 is very similar to the Abrams. It's 3 feet shorter at 23 feet and lighter, weighing in around 64 tons. Being smaller and lighter might be seen as a disadvantage, but this means that they are able to be faster and more agile. The Type 99 is faster than the Abrams with a top speed of 50 miles per hour, compared to the Abrams 42. It's also more fuel efficient, able to go about 311 miles before needing to refuel. The Abrams can only go 265. In terms of armor composition, the Chinese guard this secret very closely, so little is known. Although it is thought that the Type 99 armor is similar to the Abrams in general, it's also thought to have an advanced explosive armor system as well. Explosive armor systems are key to combating advanced anti-tank and armor-piercing missiles. In terms of armament, the Type 99 has the ZPT-98 cannon, which is similar to a Russian design and comes in at 125mm. It has an effective range of about 3,000 meters. Both tanks can fire a variety of shells from high explosives and armor-piercing rounds to anti-personnel rounds. The Abrams also has something the Type 99 does not, a fourth crew member. This crew member's job is to load the shells. This is done by an autoloader on the Type 99. As it currently stands, the autoloader can load and fire 8 shells a minute. A human in similar conditions has the potential to be faster. So, looking at the Abrams and Type 99, they are both incredibly impressive tanks, but we have to give the edge to the Abrams here. Not only has it proved its efficiency in combat for 20 years, but it also has the edge when it comes to range and fire rate. If we knew more about the Type 99, we may change our answer, but until more is revealed or we see them go head-to-head, -head, the Abrams is the winner, although it's close. Shifting gears and going up to the sky, let's look at air power. The Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II is a fifth-generation aircraft and is incredibly impressive and versatile. Since being developed in 2006 and slowly rolled out to the US military, it's become one of the most expensive aircraft on Earth. 
The F-35 features unmatched stealth, sensor fusion, the most powerful engine out there for fighters, and the most advanced radar system in the world. The pilots are even being equipped with an augmented reality helmet that improves their awareness and effectiveness in combat. I think it's safe to say we're close to Star Wars level weapons here. The F-35 has a wingspan of 35 feet, a length of 51 feet, and a maximum speed of about 1,200 miles per hour, or Mach 1.6. Its single Pratt & Whitney F-135 PW100 engine also boasts a thrust of 40,000 pounds and an afterburner for supersonic flight and quick acceleration. The F-35 has a combat range of about 1,380 miles and a ceiling of 55,000 feet. In terms of weapons, the F-35 can support a payload of up to 18,000 pounds. If it's in the configuration known as Beast Mode, yes, it's really called that, the F-35 can support up to 22,000 pounds of payload. It has a 25mm cannon, as well as up to 6 missiles, 8 bombs, and 4 laser-guided bombs. Not too shabby. The Chinese counterpart is also a 5th generation aircraft and is known as the Chengdu J-20. This was the first Chinese aircraft that was put on public display when it was unveiled, although like everything else, the Chinese are very secretive about its specifics. What we do know is that it's a twin-engine aircraft with two Shenyang WS turbofans and also has an afterburner. Its top speed is around Mach 2.25 or 1,725 miles per hour, which makes it much faster than the F-35. It also has a combat range of about 1,100 miles and a ceiling of 66,000 feet. For weapons, the J-20 features a similar loadout in terms of precision-guided munitions, but the real difference is that the J-20 does not have a cannon like the F-35. That means that if the J-20 were to get into a dogfight, all it would have is air-to-air -air missiles. So who would win if such a dogfight were to happen? The answer is clear, it's the F-35. The F-35 has better stealth capabilities, and while the J-20 is faster, the F-35 has a smaller radar cross-section, which means it's less detectable. So the F-35 could be locked on and ready to fire before you even know they're there. Another major disadvantage for the J-20 is the lack of cannon we just mentioned, so the F-35 has the advantage in dogfights. Even though it seems like the F-35 has the technical edge, it very well could come down to the skill of the two pilots. Diving into naval forces, let's take a look at who has better destroyer-class ships in the US Navy or the Navy of the People's Liberation Army. A major undertaking by the US Navy in recent years was building three of the Zumwalt-class destroyers. These next-generation destroyers are among the most advanced the Navy has to offer, with state-of-the-art stealth systems that allow it to move like a ghost through the water, as well as a brand-new propulsion system and wave-piercing tumble-home hull. According to the US Navy, the Zumwalt-class destroyers are the largest and most technologically advanced surface combatants in the world. Built by Bath Ironworks, it features an integrated power system of two Rolls-Royce MT-30 gas turbines with two auxiliary generators. It's over 600 feet in length and has a displacement of about 16,000 metric tons. It can reach speeds of over 30 knots and has a crew of about 200. In terms of weapons, it has two 30mm gun systems, two 155mm advanced gun systems, and 80 vertical launch cells for a variety of missiles. It's capable of many different offensive and defensive capabilities, including long-range precision strike, anti-air warfare (AAW), anti-submarine warfare (ASW), and anti-surface warfare (ASUW). It even has the capability to launch an MH-60R helicopter. It should be noted that for the 155mm advanced gun systems, the rounds are extremely expensive, about a million apiece and the Navy really has no interest in getting any more than it already has, so these guns are somewhat outdated already. All in all, the Zumwalt-class destroyers are extremely impressive, but how do they stand up to the PLA Navy? The closest thing to it is the Type 055 destroyer. The Type 055 is about 590 feet long and 60 feet wide. With a full load, it has a displacement between 13,000 and 14,000 tons. The Type 055 has four QC-280 gas turbines, each providing about 23 to 28 megawatts of energy. The design is fairly conventional, with some exposed guns and sensors. This is the opposite of the Zumwalt. Everything is enclosed, however, the Type 055 is superior in its radar technology. The Type 055 has 112 vertical launch cells, firing a variety of missiles and torpedoes. It also features a 130mm gun on the bow, as well as several other close-in weapon systems for a last line of defense. 
Overall, the two ships are similar, but will have different missions. The Type 055 will focus on air and sea defense, while the Zumwalt will be focused more on targets on land and firing from close to the shore. So while they might be similar in some respects, they are for different purposes and we cannot give a clear edge to one or the other. Turning from traditional weapons and looking at something more unconventional and something that always seems to be in the news, cyber warfare. Obviously, we don't have a ton of information about what all goes into the cyber warfare departments or what they're capable of. They'd be pretty bad at their jobs if you could just read that info online. The US Cyber Command was founded in 2010 and seeks to unify the direction of cyberspace operations while continuing to bolster the Department of Defense's cyber capabilities overall. Its mission statement reads, US Cybercom plans, coordinates, integrates, synchronizes, and conducts activities to direct the operations and defense of specified Department of Defense information networks, and prepare to, and when directed, conduct full-spectrum military cyberspace operations in order to enable actions in all domains, ensure US allied freedom of action in cyberspace, and deny the same to our adversaries. Since 2015, the US has added an additional 133 new cyber teams to its arsenal. These include 13 national mission teams to defend against broad cyber attacks, 68 cyber protection teams to defend priority DoD networks and systems against priority threats, 27 combat mission teams to provide integrated cyberspace attacks in support of operational plans and contingency operations, 25 cyber support teams to provide analytic and planning support to the national mission and combat mission teams. Estimates of how many personnel are in Cyber Command range from 6,000 to 20,000. The mission of Cyber Command is to operate both offensively and defensively across the globe, combating malicious actors, counter ransomware attacks, and provide support to the DoD. How do the Chinese stack up in the new front lines of the cyber landscape? Again, everyone is incredibly secretive when it comes to cyber, but what we do know is that the Chinese have multiple units or groups actively engaging in cyber warfare at any given time. Some of these units are within the PLA, some within the government, and other various ones. It was estimated in 2017 that they had between 50 and 100,000 personnel designated as hackers, but who knows whether this is true or not. The Chinese military described their objectives in terms of cyber warfare capabilities as follows. Cyberspace situational awareness, cyber defense, support for the country's endeavors in cyberspace, and participation in international cyber cooperation. Who has the advantage? Unless you have top-secret security clearance, I don't think any of us can truly answer that question. So as things continue to unfold, we'll just call this one a draw as well. Last but certainly not least, let's look at the biggest, baddest, and most horrifying weapons of all, nuclear. The US nuclear capabilities on land consist of about 450 launch sites capable of firing the Minuteman III ICBMs with 14 nuclear-capable submarines and over 60 nuclear-capable heavy bombers. Since tensions with Russia and China continue to climb, the US military is working toward modernizing and upgrading its nuclear defense systems. Overall, it's estimated that the US has about 5,000 warheads in total. For reference, a Minuteman III ICBM is about 60 feet in length, weighs 80,000 pounds, and has a range of 8,700 miles. They're each armed with three W62 Mark 12 warheads that each contain over 170 kilotons of TNT. The Chinese nuclear arsenal is estimated by the Pentagon to contain between 400 to 500 warheads, possibly reaching over 1,000 by 2030. Not much information about Chinese capabilities is publicly available, so we can only speculate. Who gets the advantage? It doesn't really matter after the first one detonates. Whether you have 20 or 20,000, it's all downhill after that initial boom. In conclusion, the militaries of the United States and China are extremely technologically advanced, well-trained, and deadly. So who has the edge overall? You can compare them and argue this point or that, but at the end of the day, none of it matters until the troops and equipment meet on the battlefield. Both sides have incredibly impressive troops and hardware, but the US is the only one with recent combat experience, so if any theoretical advantage is to be had, it would be that. Either way, let's just hope that the US and PLA troops never actually meet on the battlefield. A conflict between these two global superpowers would bring about nothing but widespread death and destruction to millions. No one wants that, except maybe the ones selling the weapons. So as tensions continue to escalate, just remembering how many nukes there are in the world might help everyone take a deep breath. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know what you think in the comments. 
Now go and check out the US M1 Abrams versus the Chinese Type 99 tank battle, or click this other video instead. China's been all about diplomatic charm, pushing a military non-intervention policy as its way of playing nice for economic gains. But let's not kid ourselves. That strategy has a lot to do with the tight hold the US and NATO pals have on key regions like Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific. Despite emerging as the world's second-largest economy, outpacing Western counterparts through sheer volume, China finds itself at a crossroads. Industrially, it's a powerhouse, fueled by an expansive workforce. Technologically, however, it trails behind the US, revealing a significant gap in innovation and military prowess. This gap has become glaringly apparent in the face of military conflicts such as the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. The conflict has not only tested the mettle of those directly involved, but also offered a window into the Western military arsenal. As Ukraine continues to receive a steady flow of support from NATO, including tanks, missiles, you name it, arming them to stand their ground or at least hold the line against Russia, the world witnesses the depth and breadth of Western military support. But just how deep does the rabbit hole of Western weaponry superiority go? Follow us as we dive into the cutting-edge arsenal that's shaping the balance of power on the global stage. Let's take the newest missile systems as an example. There are three main missiles that Ukraine has received to turn the tide of the war. Storm Shadows, Attackums, and Star Streaks. The Storm Shadow is among the latest generation missiles produced by the UK and France. It's one of the most consistent air-to-ground ordinances available and Ukraine has managed to use its potential to remove Russian infrastructure with great success. The secret behind the Storm Shadow's effectiveness lies in its increased range. While traditional missiles could reliably hit targets from 70 or 80 miles away, the maximum range of the Storm Shadow is around 150 miles. This means that Ukrainian forces could feasibly push Russia back away from its borders with precision strikes to infrastructure and supply convoys. The increased range allows the Storm Shadow to be fired out of detection giving Russia much less time to respond and minimize the damage. Storm Shadows also have the logistical and tactical advantage over many similar missiles currently in use. Due to a trifecta of state-of-the-art navigational systems, GPS, inertial positioning, and terrain contour matching, the Storm Shadow has unparalleled accuracy. Additionally, since the systems are designed to provide redundancy, the missile is much less susceptible to technological counterattacks. If an enemy tried to disable one of the navigational systems, the rest would be able to guide the missile to the target without any issues. The combination of range and security means that the Storm Shadow missiles can present a serious long-range artillery threat. This is further emphasized by the fact that Ukraine has had major success with the missile, despite its inability to utilize its potential to the fullest. While the Storm Shadow has excellent navigation systems, the pilot still needs to lock onto the target. With more advanced aircraft, the targeting system can work in sync with the missile. This allows it to use a fire-and-forget launching method, giving the pilot free reign to retreat from enemy airspace. If combined with a long-range aircraft, the Storm Shadow can strike down enemy targets with minimal danger to the pilot and the plane. However, Ukraine didn't have planes that could integrate these advanced targeting systems. The Soviet-era MiG-29 and Su-27s weren't designed with those capabilities, and the country hasn't done much to upgrade the planes with more modern systems. As a result, the army has been forced to use makeshift systems that could only partially leverage the Storm Shadow's power. This typically means that the weapon's range would be decreased to that of the targeting system, in Ukraine's case, it resulted in a range of roughly 100 miles, with anything above that heavily reducing accuracy. Considering that even with a technological mismatch between Ukrainian planes and the Storm Shadow, Ukraine has been able to get solid results, imagine how effective those missiles would be with proper support from modern aircraft. This should be possible in a few months, however, since the US, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium have agreed to send F-16s to Ukraine. With these fourth-generation aircraft, the Storm Shadows could be used to their full extent. Similar concepts apply to the other two missiles. The Attackums, for example, is a ground-deployed missile that requires a truck launcher. It has a higher speed than the Storm Shadow and can be outfitted with either a unitary or submunition warhead. When used with submunition warheads, Attackums can cover a huge area with explosives, making them especially effective at taking out enemy infantry and damaging infrastructure. However, the Attackums alone wouldn't be such a danger for the Russian troops. The real benefit came from the US sending HIMARS to Ukraine to outfit them. 
These mobile launchers can carry a vast assortment of missiles and can easily navigate the war-torn roads and harsh terrain across Ukraine. Additionally, HIMARS can be more easily camouflaged, allowing them to be deployed closer to the front line while minimizing the chance of detection. Finally, the vehicles could rapidly fire the missiles in stock and then drive away, giving enemies little time to determine their location and launch a counterattack. HIMARS have also been vital in cutting off Russian supplies from the war fronts. Due to the system's increased range compared to the closest Russian analog, the BM-30, HIMARS can be deployed to target and endanger vital bridges and roads that connect the Ukrainian outskirts with the border. Russians are then forced into a war of attrition where they can't engage the Ukrainian army due to a lack of equipment or supplies. Worse still, they also can't feasibly retreat without incurring heavy losses since the main channels are ripe for artillery attacks. As a prime example, Ukraine destroyed 50 ammunition depots within the first months of HIMARS being deployed throughout the country, decimating Russia's access to weapons. Even with all these perks, it should be noted that up until now, Ukraine has only received Atakum's M39 Block 1 missiles. These are submunition warhead missiles, but their range is drastically smaller than other Atakum's missiles at only 100 miles. Given that other types of missiles have an effective range in the realm of 170 to 190 miles, Western countries have an even more potent version of the Atakum's sitting in silos, waiting to be used against China if they happen to go to war. Finally, the Starstreak missiles are man-portable anti-air missiles capable of taking down enemy aircraft with extreme precision. They are unique in the sense that their warhead is split into three tungsten alloy darts with a delayed explosive charge. This creates a wider impact area should the darts hit a target, while also minimizing the risk of misfiring and failure to detonate. Due to a delayed explosion, the charges can be devastating against light-armored vehicles and aircraft. The tungsten dart first penetrates the armor casing, which triggers the delayed fuse. Once the dart is firmly embedded into the target, the charges detonate. A Starstreak missile is reportedly capable of splitting a helicopter in half. Additionally, the Starstreaks operate through a laser-guided targeting system. The operator must maintain line of sight on the target, limiting the missile's effective range to around 4.3 miles. However, the later iterations of the Starstreak guidance system heavily reduced the necessity to maintain tracking of the target at all times. The laser beams are effectively wider than the target, forming a two-dimensional matrix overlaying it. The reflections and imperfections in the matrix surface are picked up by the missile's targeting system, indicating the location of the target. Even if the targeting laser loses line of sight, the residual matrix location can be used as a fallback plan. While the Starstreak was developed in the late 90s, China hasn't unveiled a similar missile targeting and delivery system since. The closest analog is the FN-6. However, FN-6s have a shorter range and use an infrared targeting system. Although China claims that the system is resistant to flare interception, it's one of the biggest and most reliable counters to infrared designs. Furthermore, the FN-6 is closer in design to the older US Stinger missiles, which were largely considered to have been made obsolete by the Starstreaks. Therefore, China's ground-based short-range anti-air defense is lagging behind the capabilities of Western countries. The efficiency of the Western military technology in Russia doesn't concern only artillery and missiles. NATO has supplied Ukraine with roughly $80 billion in humanitarian, military, and direct financial assistance, giving them access to resources the country couldn't have obtained in years otherwise. This is most notable in the efficiency and doggedness of Ukrainian troops. If we calculate the losses incurred by Russia over the last two years, the figures reaches a staggering 315,000 soldiers. Some sources suggest this figure is even higher. This is a combined number of deaths and injuries that have made soldiers unable to return to the battlefield, equaling 87% of the country's total army size at the start of the invasion. While Russia has instituted widespread conscription campaigns and it has the benefit of having a much larger population to draw from, this is a monumental loss of people over two years. According to some estimates, it would make Russia's losses among the top five deadliest wars in the 21st century based on their duration. China has obviously seen the effect massive donations, financial aid, and military support can have on the world stage. While China's stance in the 2022 Russian invasion appears non-confrontational, their tacit or overt support for Russia speaks volumes. As the global community largely decries Russia's actions in Ukraine, China's silence and criticism of Western sanctions against Russia stands out. But what does China's economic lifeline to Russia amidst European sanctions reveal about the deeper strategic play at work? 
With Europe cutting off Russian energy exports to stifle military funding, China's move to tap into Siberia's resources not only rescues Russia from potential economic isolation, but also secures its own energy needs at bargain prices. How does this strategic maneuver affect the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, and what implications might it hold for global politics? China's main sore point in the 20th and 21st centuries is Taiwan, or Chinese Taipei. While China has been determined to exert more control over Taiwan, the island nation is currently being protected by the US military. Furthermore, China's claims in the South China Sea are directly contesting several nations in the region, creating a tense situation for China. The portion of the South China Sea that the country claims almost go to the vital Strait of Malacca, one of the busiest trading routes in the world and one of the main oil and gas transport routes between the Middle East and China. Considering that the Strait of Malacca is not under direct Chinese control, China has to depend on other countries in the area, allowing Chinese oil and gas-bearing ships to pass through the strait. These points of contention have resulted in a tenuous relationship between China and countries in the Indo-Pacific, all with China still trying to maintain its claims in the surrounding areas and exert more political and military pressure on Taiwan. This situation led to the creation of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad, between India, Japan, Australia, and the US. The Quad's main objective is to limit China's influence in the Indo-Pacific, creating a barrier between it and the other nations of the region. This is further complicated by the fact that China maintains claims on parts of the Himalayas that belong to India, creating additional strains between these two countries. As a result, India has even more of an incentive to oppose China's influence in the region. This has been further exacerbated by India recently opening more dialogues with the Western countries. In a deal with the US, India agreed on a plan that uses railroads and ports to transport goods between Europe and India. The plan involves building a series of railways to bypass the constricted Suez Canal, instead using Israeli Mediterranean ports in the west and the UAE's ports on the east of the Arabian Peninsula. The plan was made in response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to directly connect China to Europe via roadways, but also utilizing the Suez Canal and Strait of Malacca for international seaport access. China's BRI also plans to infuse Pakistan with $60 billion in investments to utilize the country's coal resources. China, therefore, has made extensive plans to become partially independent from its neighboring countries economically and prevent significant bottlenecks in its material imports. While China is the world's largest economy, its industry is heavily reliant on importing goods and raw materials. While the country has a significant population, it doesn't have nearly enough natural resources to maintain a growing industry. Any Western initiatives that ultimately control how much China can import goods and exert geopolitical and financial influence on other nations creates pressure on China's manufacturing industry. That's why China is hesitant to stir up trouble in its surroundings. If China makes the first move and it doesn't immediately gain positive results, it could end up in a similar situation as Russia is currently. However, what needs to be kept in mind are the main differences between the Russo-Ukrainian war and a potential China-Western conflict. Principally, that the West is only a proxy and a donator in the former. If China instigates a military conflict against the Western nations, they would be witness to the full military might of the West. During the war in Ukraine, NATO countries have been sending their last-generation equipment and weaponry. For example, the Storm Shadow has been in use by the UK and France since 1997, and both countries are currently developing an updated, more deadly version of the missile. According to a statement issued by the British Ministry of Defense, the replacement for the Storm Shadow, tentatively called the Future Cruise Anti-Ship Weapon, is expected to be in service by 2028. Another area where last-generation technology is prevailing in Ukraine is military aircraft. Ukraine's native airplanes include Soviet-era MiG-29 and Su-27s, which were basically left over from the Union after it broke up. Ukraine has done its best to maintain these planes, but their equipment hasn't been updated to modern standards. In contrast, Russia has upgraded its Soviet planes with modern radar and tracking capabilities, giving them an aerial advantage over Ukrainian planes. Additionally, Russia is also using the more advanced version of the plane with the designation Su-35. These are late fourth-generation planes, Russian counterparts to the F-15. Despite their upgrades, Russia has failed to maintain total air superiority over Ukraine, partially due to the vast amount of missiles that Ukraine can use to shoot down Russian aircraft. Some experts also believe that the Su-35 is vastly underperforming compared to its American counterparts, making them insufficient to gain an advantage in enemy territory. 
If that wasn't enough, the West, as mentioned previously, has also agreed to donate their F-16s to Ukraine. But what does that mean for the conflict ahead? These aircraft are planned to enter service sometime during 2024 due to heavy training requirements of Ukrainian pilots unfamiliar with these aircraft. By all accounts, the NATO countries that are sending these aircraft are basically decommissioning them from service in their respective aerial forces, mainly due to the F-16 being considered obsolete by modern standards. Instead, NATO members are currently purchasing and expecting a stockpile of modern F-35s and other aircraft to replenish their aging air force. The F-16s being shipped to Ukraine are expected to have a significant impact in the ongoing conflict. Some estimates show that the F-16s will help Ukraine exert air superiority over its entire airspace, with the F-16s providing key strategic and tactical support due to their improved radar range and service life. Other benefits of F-16 donations will give Ukraine the ability to fully utilize the advanced missiles they were given since Soviet era planes have largely incompatible missile targeting and launch systems for them. But where does that leave China? According to the latest reports from the Chinese military, the Mighty Dragon, or Chengdu J-20, is rumored to be the country's fifth-generation all-purpose military aircraft. While its specifications haven't been publicly released, leaks and extrapolations based on known equipment suggest that China is hoping it would have sufficient capabilities to go against F-22s and F-35s. However, the J-20 has been largely derived from previous-generation airplanes. In the main, this was due to China being able to steal information on military aircraft specs, or in one case, there were reports of Chinese agents crisscrossing the region where the F-117 disintegrated, buying up the parts from the plane from local farmers. But even if China could reverse-engineer the F-117's stealth technology, that's only a first-generation stealth aircraft, far behind the modern F-22s and F-35s. Add to that the fact that China seemingly hasn't been able to produce a jet engine on par with American engineering. By most accounts, the most recently updated version of the J-20 uses native WS-15 engines, which behave slightly worse than the engines inside F-22s. While China can feasibly manufacture many more engines, and some plans suggest that it aims to have 1,000 airplanes in service by 2030, the country is heavily reliant on efficient supply chains to do so. If China gets cut off from its resources, such as Russia deciding to sever its trading agreements with Beijing, for example, then its ambitions of building an air force that might be able to compete with the US could fail entirely. This circles back to the current Russo-Ukrainian conflict. With China relying on Russia to be a major trading partner and using Russia's plentiful natural resources in Siberia, it's no surprise that Xi doesn't want to stir up the pot and change the situation. After all, the current Russian regime is falling right into China's hands. Additionally, a prolonged war in Ukraine is more or less forcing NATO to intervene, if only by investing more financial resources and equipment into outfitting Ukraine. The current Israeli-Palestinian conflict has also played out well for China, delaying the progress of the Europe-Middle East-India trading corridor and even shutting down the entire project due to the complex and unstable geopolitical situation. This means that China has free reign to plan for its ambitions of the Belt and Road Initiative due to a lack of viable trading alternatives. Furthermore, Saudi Arabia has staunchly remained neutral on this front, trying to use whichever initiative will benefit them the most. But if Russia fails to maintain supremacy in the Russo-Ukrainian war, then the country may experience a significant shift in ideology. In the unlikely case of Putin being removed from office, there's a chance that his successor might not view a close relationship with China so favorably. After all, China is currently laying claim to the Russian province of Outer Manchuria, which has been a significant thorn for China during the past century. It represents one of the only remaining pieces of territory that China hasn't been able to get back after the unequal treaties in the 19th and 20th century. All of which means that China might be actively trying to create a foothold in the area under the guise of extending its trading partnership with Russia. The geopolitical situation would also suggest that China might be gunning for the entire Siberian Far East and for multiple reasons. Apart from being rich in natural resources, Lake Balkai is located in Siberia, the largest freshwater deposit in the world which would be an excellent target for exploitation to fuel the water-starved population centers in China. Additionally, controlling Siberia would provide China with access to the Sea of Japan on the east and even the Arctic Ocean up north. While the latter might seem insignificant, Arctic routes will allow China to bypass the maritime routes that depend on the Suez Canal and vital straits in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, this would make Beijing less dependent on favorable diplomatic ties with the countries that control them.
Making a move against Russia relies on China not facing any opposition from its south, which is where the US Navy is stationed. Additionally, the US has been outfitting its Marine Corps to be more independent all-terrain tactical support units. If the US can maintain control of military bases in the East China Sea, the Marines can support the US Navy and Air Force by exerting extreme area control. This would prevent the Chinese Navy from mounting a significant offensive or defensive front in the area. In a hypothetical Sino-Russian conflict, the US and the rest of the Quad could retaliate against China, cut off the Strait of Malacca and the resource transport it brings, and possibly force China to give up its claims over Taiwan. Therefore, China's only viable move is to remain a relatively silent observer in the matter. The future of the Russo-Ukrainian war hinges on whether Western weaponry can close out the war in Ukraine's favor quickly or risk the country being overwhelmed in an attrition war. If Russia loses, China might rapidly start losing the trading benefits it's received so far, but it might not have enough military power to influence that after the fact. But what do you think of China's non-interference policy in the war? Will China mount an offensive on Russia or Taiwan anytime soon? Let us know in the comment section below and thank you for watching the video. Now go and check out why the war in Ukraine shows the US military would destroy the Russian military. Or click this other video instead. Here's a nerve-wracking question for you. Why has China been strengthening its military? Does the fastest military expansion since World War II and a campaign of non-military attacks suggest that China is already at war with the US? Or are the reasons for this more complex than meets the eye? In 1996, Taiwan held its first direct presidential election and transitioned to a fully-fledged democracy. This election set off the third Taiwan Strait crisis, with mainland China firing missiles across the water. In response, the United States sent two carrier battle groups to the area, with the USS Nimitz and her colleagues passing through the strait. Beijing had no choice but to back down in the face of this pressure. The incident, which came at the height of the American unipolar moment, is almost entirely forgotten in the United States today, but Beijing always remembered. To the Chinese leadership, the crisis and its conclusion recalled the century of humiliation, the period between 1839 and 1949 where China repeatedly found itself invaded, dictated to, and partitioned by the Western powers and Japan. China vowed to never be at such a disadvantage again. 28 years later, with Taiwan having held another presidential election in January, the situation is vastly different. In this video, we will dive into the details of China's military buildup and how it's changed the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. In December 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization. This event was arguably more important to global politics than even the September 11th attacks, as China's entry into the WTO allowed it to entrench itself at the center of many of the world's most critical supply chains and become the world's largest trading and manufacturing nation. Beijing took advantage of the vast wealth accruing to its coffers to spend much more money on its military. Between 2000 and 2016, China's military budget increased at a 10% annual rate. Since then, the rate has slowed, but the military budget has still gone up by 5-7% to 7 per year. In 1995, at the beginning of the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, China wasn't even in the top 10 of worldwide military spenders. Even Taiwan spent more. By 2002, the first year after joining the WTO, China spent about $30 billion on its military, 10 times less than the United States, and was still behind the United Kingdom and Japan. 18 years later, China spent about $260 billion on its military reducing the gap to about three times less than the United States. However, China's budget actually understates the amount that goes into its military, and China might be spending about $60 billion more per year on its armed forces than advertised. While the spending in absolute dollars still suggests the United States has a big advantage in the military balance of power, fundamentals beneath the hood suggest that China is eroding America's traditional dominance in ways disproportionate to the total spending. The United States armed forces are stretched around the world in global commitments. Meanwhile, China can concentrate all of its military spending in the decisive Indo-Pacific region. This is not the only advantage China has. In 2022, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Major General Cameron Holt warned that China was acquiring weaponry at a rate five to six times faster than the United States. He further warned, in purchasing power parity, 
they spend about $1 to our $20 to get the same capability. We are going to lose if we can't figure out how to drop the cost and increase the speed in our defense supply chains. China's military buildup accelerated when Xi Jinping took power in 2012. Xi has an unusual personal interest in military affairs, at least in comparison with his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin. Unlike them, Xi holds the title of Commander-in-Chief of the Joint Operations Command Center, while China's People's Liberation Army has always been responsible to the Communist Party and its leader. The new title gives Xi Jinping command at the operational and field level that his predecessors didn't have. Xi also has strong personal and familial ties with the PLA that his predecessors lacked. His father, Xi Zhongzhong, was a military leader in World War II and the Civil War. Even Xi's wife, Pen Li Yuan, was a civilian member of the PLA with the rank equivalent to Major General. Many of those closest to him are also military men with deep ties to the institution. How has China built up its military? First, it has rapidly expanded its People's Liberation Army Navy in both numbers and capability. This was an innovation. China has traditionally been a land rather than a sea power, but its containment in the first island chain and its dependence on commercial shipping necessitated a change. With the first island chain full of American allies and choke points, vulnerable to being blocked by the United States Navy, the leadership in Beijing determined that it must have a stronger navy of its own. As late as 2010, China had no aircraft carriers. However, China had in 1998 purchased the sister ship of Russia's Admiral Kuznetsov carrier, and after a long odyssey, finally commissioned the ship as the Liaoning in 2012. In 2019, China launched the Shandong, its first domestically produced carrier based on the Liaoning. However, these two carriers use ski jumps called the Stobar system to launch their planes. This is slower than America's Nimitz and Ford-class carriers, which use a catapult system. Not wanting to be outdone, China launched the Fujian in 2022. This is China's first wholly domestically designed aircraft carrier, and like its American counterparts, it uses a catapult system. Tellingly, the Fujian was named after the province located across the strait from Taiwan. China has no plans to stop with the Fujian. It's currently building at least one more aircraft carrier, codenamed the Type 004. This carrier, which looks very similar to the US Navy's Gerald R. Ford, will be the first in China's fleet to operate on nuclear power, which will give it the ability to stay at sea for much longer durations than its predecessors and at much further ranges. Nuclear-powered ships also have an advantage in generating electricity needed to power advanced weapons and equipment. Some American national security experts believe that China could have five aircraft carriers by 2031, with the newer ones having nuclear propulsion to give them longer ranges and staying power at sea. China also now has the world's largest navy, with 426 hulls in its fleet as of November 2023. However, many of these vessels are not fit for frontline combat, as they are lighter and less well-armed. This is why despite China's fleet units, it still lags behind the United States Navy in terms of combined tonnage, with the US Navy being about twice as heavy. However, a decade ago, the US Navy had a 3 to 1 advantage over the PLAN in tonnage, which shows you how serious China is about closing the gap. The gap is closed partially because China is also building cruisers and destroyers at pace. By 2031, China could have 60 of these, with modern capabilities on similar par with the US Navy's equivalent ships. China is also modernizing its submarine force. This is the area of underwater warfare where China lags the furthest behind the United States. It has 72 submarines in its fleet, but only 15 are nuclear-powered, with six being ballistic missile submarines and an additional nine being conventional attack submarines. The others are diesel-electric submarines, which have less range, cannot dive as deep, and are noisier since they can only run on electric power for a short time. However, China is investing more heavily in its submarine fleet and plans to build two new types of submarines, the Type 095 nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine and the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine. In contrast to the Type 094, the Type 095 and 096 in particular are expected to be much quieter thanks in part to sound isolation technology from Russia. This includes a raft attached to a rubber support system that reduces noise coming from the engine. There is still debate about the origin of this technology being outfitted to the much larger submarines under construction. However, these new underwater craft should at least be comparable to Russia's nuclear Akula-class submarines. 
the upgraded versions of which are already difficult to detect, according to Christopher Carlson of the US Naval War College. The PLAN is also gaining more experience on long overseas deployments. In 2008, Chinese naval flotillas were sent to the Gulf of Aden to conduct counter-piracy operations, a feat which has recurred over the years. After these missions, which tended to last for three months, the PLAN would sail to other theaters on much longer navigational missions before returning home. The PLAN has also seen frequent operations in the South China Sea, giving it more experience in waters further afield from the Chinese mainland. China's naval buildup is only part of its military modernization program. China has also taken pains to upgrade its air force. As late as the 2000s, China's People's Liberation Army Air Force relied on obsolete second-generation jet fighters like the Shenyang J-6. In addition to obsolete hardware, the PLAAF suffered severely during the Cultural Revolution, which closed many of its technical and maintenance training facilities, leaving it short of trained personnel especially those who could keep the planes fit for flight. It took decades for China to recover from this disaster. However, the PLAAF has changed drastically since the start of the 2010s. Obsolete second- and third-generation fighters have been retired. In their place, three planes have taken the lead role in the PLAAF's fleet. These are the fourth-generation Chengdu J-10C, fourth-generation Shenyang J-16, and the fifth-generation Chengdu J-20. Between these three planes, China has 600 advanced aircraft in service, with plans to expand. Between 2020 and 2023, production rates of the J-16 and J-20 doubled. At current production rates, China could field as many as 1,000 J-20 planes by 2030. The J-20 has gotten some improvements as well. In 2022, China began upgrading the plane's engine to the WS-15. Previously, the J-20's engine was the Russian AL-31, that had been developed for the Su-34. As the fighters get outfitted with the new engine, the J-20 should be able to fly at supersonic speed without using its afterburners supercruise capacity. All three of these planes have AESA radars and can be equipped with the PL-15 air-to-air missile, which has a range of up to 300 kilometers. The J-20 in particular may also be getting drone wingmen. Although the details are sparse and must be treated with skepticism, these drones could allow the manned fighter to focus on specialized tasks, like command and control. The drone, which would also be stealthy, could fire eight intelligent air-to-air -air missiles or loitering munitions, drones which linger over the battle space before attacking a target. The concept was revealed at the 2023 Zhuhai Air Show. Interestingly, the former obsolete fighters that the PLAAF was so well known for may be turned into drones themselves. Obsolete planes like the J-6 have been spotted by satellite imagery on military tarmacs despite their being retired. These drones would be easy to spot by radar if they were ever put into combat, but that is part of the point. In a scenario involving Taiwan, for example, these drones could act as a diversion that forces planes to scramble and ignore other areas more important for China's purposes, or they could simply be expendable tools designed to deplete ammunition. The concept has precedent. Starting in 2013, the USAF converted some obsolete F-16s into remotely controlled drones, the QF-16. Although this was done purely to turn them into aerial targets, China might see greater potential for this concept. China has also begun building a new type of air refueling tanker plane, the Y-20U, which made its maiden flight in 2018. The aircraft has three refueling points. The domestic engine to power this plane, the WS-20, is expected to enter production in 2024. China has also modernized its missile forces in arguably the most successful and strategically significant part of its buildup. As early as the late 90s, the Pentagon was worried about the buildup of China's air and missile forces, which it demonstrated early in the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis. Reports in 1997 suggested that for Beijing, Strengthening the accuracy of its ballistic and cruise missiles was a high priority and that within a decade, China could have as many as 1,000 new projectiles. Washington's expansion of its missile defense networks in Asia further convinced Beijing of the need for a stronger missile force. The May 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review cautioned that while the United States would face no peer competitor in the immediate future, by 2015, there would be the possibility of the emergence of a regional great power or global peer competitor. China now has more than 1,000 ballistic and cruise missiles. The closer one gets to the Chinese mainland, the more missiles there are to hit you. By 2021, China had between 750 
and 1,500 short-range ballistic missiles, with ranges of up to 1,000 kilometers, putting Taiwan and every American base in Japan, South Korea, and the northern Philippines at risk. There were between 150 and 450 medium-range missiles with ranges of 3,000 kilometers and 80 to 160 intermediate-range missiles with ranges of up to 5,500 kilometers. These missiles put American bases further afield, like the southern Philippines and Guam, the largest in the region, at risk. China also has an unknown number of cruise missiles that pose additional danger to American bases and ships in the region. Hypersonic missiles have been another item of importance for the Chinese military. American officials have conceded that China currently leads in the hypersonic race. In 2018, Mike Griffin, then Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, claimed that China had conducted more hypersonic weapons tests than the United States over the preceding decade by a factor of 20 times. China deployed one such weapon into service, the DF-17, in 2019. The DF-17 is a road-mobile, medium-range ballistic missile outfitted with a hypersonic glide vehicle. China further showed its missile capability in the summer of 2021, when it tested a hypersonic device that flew around the world before hitting its target. This weapon was a combination of a fractional orbital bombardment system FOBS, with an HGV. This was only the most spectacular of China's many missile tests in recent years. In 2022, China conducted more ballistic missile tests than every other country in the world combined. China has also begun to expand its nuclear program. Between 2020 and 2022, it doubled its nuclear arsenal from about 200 to 400 warheads. At current production rates, China could have as many as 1,500 warheads by 2035. The new missiles and nuclear warheads, as well as the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine, which would be able to launch projectiles from Chinese waters with a 9,000-kilometer range, demonstrate China's much-improved nuclear capability. In the past, China maintained a program of limited nuclear deterrence. That's now beginning to change, showing Beijing's anticipation of strategic competition with Washington. However, any kind of military equipment, no matter how technologically advanced, is useless without the proper people operating it. That's why China is focusing its military buildup on personnel as much as it is on weapons or technology. In anticipation of a high-tech military, Beijing has launched a recruitment drive seeking to bring the country's best and brightest. Military recruiters have stepped up their presence in China's schools in a bid to bring bright young graduates into service. Military recruiters have especially been keen on enlisting STEM majors in the country's university. The PLA wants 70% of its new recruits to hold at least a university undergraduate degree. As part of its recruitment goals, China increased military salaries by 40% in January 2023. The PLA also offers job security, and Chinese enterprises, especially state-owned ones, tend to give preferential treatment in hiring to discharge soldiers over those with no military experience. Veterans of the PLA will also be allowed to return to combat positions upon re-enlistment. While the recruiting drive seems to be working at keeping the active PLA personnel at a steady 2 million, the world's largest standing army, it's not all smooth sailing. According to China's own polling, only 35% of soldiers who completed their service in the PLA wanted to stay there instead of being discharged to the reserves. College graduates stayed at even lower rates, so while China has made progress in improving the quality of recruits to its military, it will need to take further steps to make it more attractive to the country's most talented minds for the long haul. Like in many other sectors, China also has corruption in its military ranks. As we've seen with Russia's experience in Ukraine, corruption within a military, especially in its logistics, can manifest deadly consequences on the battlefield. Therefore, part of China's military modernization involves rooting out corruption. As part of his anti-corruption efforts after taking office, Xi Jinping initiated a crackdown in the PLA. In 2013, his first full year, 4,024 officers, including 82 generals, were investigated, with 21 being removed. The following year, 16 senior officers were investigated. Zhu Kaihu and Guo Boxiong, who were both former vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, were investigated and jailed. Although many Western observers have wondered whether corruption in the PLA would impede China's operations the way that corruption among Russia's military ranks has, the low number of officers investigated, less than 1% of the PLA's total, likely means that it will not be as important. 
Xi continues to claim that anti-corruption is an important part of his military modernization program. In 2018, Xi launched a new anti-corruption drive to ensure that training data would not be falsified. Military discipline officers were sent to the Army's five theater commands to monitor drills. The drive was meant to increase the effectiveness of the PLA's training, which included frequent live-fire drills based on lessons learned from Western fighting forces, especially those of the United States. Xi has also made combat-ready training a priority for his military buildup. This objective is reflected in the PLA's frequent exercises with Russia. Before the mid-2000s, Chinese military drills with Russia were rare, amid lingering border disputes from the Cold War. Since then, they have become more frequent, with China increasingly playing a leading role in comparison to its strategic partner. Other exercises have also included far-afield drills with Iran. For example, in March 2023, the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian navies conducted naval exercises near the latter's coast. Xi's emphasis on corruption-free training is especially important if China's buildup is to succeed, because the PLA has lacked real combat experience since the 1979 border war with Vietnam, where it did not perform well. Training with other forces, especially those with combat experience, is a vital component for Xi's vision of a modern, first-rate Chinese military. Even though there are lingering problems, such as a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, lack of recent combat experience, and certain missing components needed for long-range power projection, such as only about two dozen tankers based on 1950s Soviet designs, China's military has come a very long way in the last decade, let alone since the third Taiwan Strait crisis. At that time, China was still regarded as a military backwater, lacking in power compared to the United Kingdom, France, and even a Russia in post-Soviet transition. The PLA was often reliant on Russian technology and completely lacked the know-how to make modern equipment. That is no longer the case. The military buildup, especially under Xi Jinping, has made China a would-be regional great power in exactly the timetable that the 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review predicted. China has greater aspirations still, with Xi setting a date of 2049 to reunify with Taiwan and become the world's leading military power. But will China succeed in this goal? Or will economic, demographic, and other institutional problems prevent this from occurring? Or are there many more problems under the hood for China's military? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. The Chinese military is one of the largest militaries on planet Earth. Spending an incredible $293 billion in 2021 on defense, they rank second in the world behind the United States. Coming in second here is impressive enough. If you know anything about Uncle Sam, then you know they won't be outspent when it comes to the military. The Chinese military is officially known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, and it consists of five service branches. The ground force or army, the navy, the air force, the rocket force which handles all kinds of ballistic, nuclear and other missiles, and the strategic support force which deals with space, cyber, electronic and political warfare. Highly trained, motivated and armed with an arsenal of deadly weapons, they are truly a formidable fighting force. However, as the world saw with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, having a massive army and all the shiny weapons you can ask for doesn't guarantee success. So, how does the PLA stack up against the rest of the world? What does history tell us about their level of preparedness? And how would they fare if a real war were to break out? Before we delve deeper into the current capabilities and strategies of the PLA, it's essential to take a step back in time. How did the PLA evolve into the formidable force we see today, and what historical events shaped its development? The journey begins with the PLA's inception on August 1, 1927 during the Nanchang Uprising, a landmark moment that ignited the Chinese Civil War. It was in the crucible of this war and the subsequent conflicts that followed where the PLA honed its skills and strategies. Throughout the 1930s, the Communist PLA and the Nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek clashed across China in a brutal struggle, a conflict that resulted in millions of casualties. Understanding this tumultuous history is key to comprehending the PLA's current form and function. One of the most pivotal events was known as the Long March, when the communist forces primarily commanded by Mao Zedong found themselves in a difficult position, facing certain encirclement and defeat. Mao took his forces on a 5,600-mile march across China to another communist stronghold. 
A fraction of his forces survived the march, but it cemented Mao as a living legend among the Chinese. His leadership and bravery gave the PLA the motivation they needed to stay in the fight. In 1937, however, hostilities were mostly put on hold when Imperial Japan invaded China. The two sides officially formed the Second United Front and decided to deal with the most apparent threat, the Japanese, before resuming the fraternal bloodshed. During World War II, the PLA played a pivotal role in the Allied resistance against Japan. They had very few technological advantages, very, very few armored units, poor weaponry, and no real training, but they persisted nonetheless. Chinese resistance would continually infuriate and demoralize the Japanese invaders. They employed a wide range of guerrilla tactics and were an extremely useful ally of the United States and British forces. Once World War II ended in 1945, the PLA and Kuomintang went right back to killing each other. The second phase of the Chinese Civil War ran from 1945 until 1949 and again resulted in millions of casualties and untold levels of destruction. The PLA proved they had what it took to win, however, as they won the hearts and minds of the Chinese people and proved far more capable and competent at governing than their nationalist brethren. Finally, in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists suffered defeat after defeat, lost control over the country, and retreated to Taiwan. Even though they did not admit defeat, the war was over. Mao, the Communist Party, and the PLA had won, and their victory was the cornerstone in establishing the People's Republic of China. The celebrations were short-lived, however, as China joined the Cold War on the side of the Soviet Union. The skyrocketing tensions eventually erupted into incredible levels of violence again, this time against the United States and its allies. China joined the rapidly escalating Korean War on October 19, 1950, when the PLA crossed the Yalu River to support their North Korean allies. It was this force that was temporarily renamed the People's Volunteer Army, the logic being that using the word volunteer was implying a less aggressive stance on behalf of the Chinese government meaning that the troops were there as volunteers out of a sense of duty to their Korean comrades. Not sure the rebranding made a difference to the men on the ground, whichever side they fought for. Once the Chinese forces crossed the Yalu, they swept through North Korea, pushing back UN and US forces until it came to a head at a place called Chosin Reservoir. This battle is infamous for its ferocity, horrendous weather conditions, as well as the overall resilience and bravery of the men who fought there. With temperatures dropping to as low as minus 38 Fahrenheit, frostbite was rampant and many men were pushed to their breaking point. The Chinese forces here had a variety of weapons and equipment. Some were left over from the Japanese and Kuomintang troops, while others were scavenged from fallen Americans or provided by their Soviet allies. This lack of continuity presented an interesting logistical challenge for their supply lines, but the PLA persisted nonetheless. Most of their weapons were small arms such as rifles, submachine guns, light machine guns, grenades, and mortars. The PLA did not have much in the way of heavy weapons such as artillery or air support, and what they did have usually came from the Soviets. The greatest resource the PLA had at this point was its manpower. During the battle, they employed rapid flanking and infiltration tactics aimed at maximizing their numerical advantage, similar to what the Soviets did during World War II. The thinking was that if you threw enough men at a numerically inferior position, eventually they would overwhelm it or the Americans would run out of ammunition and be surrounded. Accounts from the battle describe seeing wave after wave of Chinese troops attacking US and UN positions with grim determination to fight for every foot of ground. These tactics saw success but were always accompanied by staggering casualty rates. Battling against the enemy as well as the elements, the Chinese troops and their North Korean allies eventually captured a large part of the battlefield. However, they paid for it with a tremendous amount of blood, with the true winner of the battle still being debated today. Cho Sin had proven to the PLA, as well as the world, that the Chinese military was not a backwater force of ill-equipped peasants. While they may not have had the best equipment, they used what they had to deadly effect. One thing was clear, the PLA was becoming a modern military force capable of taking on the UN and the United States. The Chinese-Soviet relationship meant that the PLA would continue to receive weapons, training, and guidance from their Russian counterparts as the Cold War escalated. After the Korean War, the PLA continued its march toward modernization through a series of smaller conflicts and proxy wars. With the death of the Communist Party leader Mao Zedong in 1976, China began even more campaigns to modernize the PLA and level the playing field with the rest of the world. 
From 1975 to today, the PLA has undergone a tremendous change and has become one of the world's most formidable militaries, at least on paper. The two most recent examples of the PLA's combat experience illustrate how far they have come and how far they have to go. Since 1975, these two examples are the only times the PLA has seen legitimate combat, and what happened in each speaks volumes about where the PLA stands today. In 1979, China and Vietnam fought a war now known as the Sino-Vietnamese War. This dispute between neighbors started as a response to Vietnam's invasion and occupation of their neighbor Cambodia. Vietnam set out to put an end to the particularly murderous and Chinese-backed Khmer Rouge regime. The Khmer Rouge had been in power since their victory over the Cambodian government in 1975. From 1975 to 1979, the Khmer Rouge conducted widespread genocide on the Cambodian people. When the dust settled, between 1.5 to 3 million people had been murdered, which at this time was a quarter of the Cambodian population. Vietnam did not like what was going on across their western border and liked it even less when the Khmer Rouge soldiers attacked across the Vietnamese border repeatedly. This back and forth went on for a few years, but it exploded on Christmas Day, December 25, 1978, when Vietnam decided to invade Cambodia. Vietnamese forces overthrew the Khmer Rouge government in just two weeks and installed their own puppet government. Seeing as the Khmer Rouge had been backed by the Chinese, the Chinese government was very angry and vowed to retaliate. This retaliation started on February 17, 1979 and lasted for about a month. PLA forces overran the northern Vietnamese border and gained large amounts of territory quickly. The northern part of Vietnam saw heavy fighting and tremendous casualties on both sides. Most of the fighting took place in the provinces of Cao Bang, Lao Cai, and Lang Son. The Vietnamese tried to avoid direct confrontations, instead opting for what had been their bread and butter for decades, guerrilla warfare. The PLA force that they faced had not seen real combat since the early 1950s and was a little rusty. The weapons and vehicles they used were outdated or not up to the task. Their soldiers were mostly untested and green. The Vietnamese, on the other hand, had been fighting continually since World War II and had mostly modern weapons. The fighting raged until March 16, 1979, with both sides claiming victory. China claimed it had won a victory and had opened the road to Hanoi, basically saying that they could have taken the capital, but they just didn't want to. The Vietnamese forces remained as an occupying force in Cambodia and claimed that they had won by repelling the PLA forces and forcing them to withdraw. With thousands upon thousands dead and nothing really gained by either side, things returned to normal and nothing had really changed. For the PLA, although not much had been gained, they realized quickly that to be a competitive military in a fast-paced world, they needed to up their game and continually improve. This served as a wake-up call and ego check. From the end of the Sino-Vietnamese War in 1979 all the way until 2016, the PLA had a few engagements, but nothing of substance. The next time they saw significant combat came in 2016, when they were part of a UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. This conflict was the first test of the PLA's combat capabilities for the first time in four decades and served as an indication of the combat readiness and effectiveness of the PLA. China committed combat troops to the UN for the first time in 2015, a major divergence from their long-held stance of no foreign intervention. Since 2000, China had steadily increased their military aid to the UN and in early 2015 sent 700 combat soldiers to South Sudan. The Chinese government did not undertake this mission simply out of the goodness of their heart, however, as the Chinese government has significant financial interests in Sudanese petroleum. Say what you will, but I challenge you to find any government that does things solely to help people and not for some ulterior motive. Glass houses, folks. Glass houses. In 2016, the peacekeeping soldiers of the PLA were responsible for the security of a large section of the South Sudanese capital of Juba. Due to decades of rampant violence, there were over 37,000 displaced civilians in and around the capital. The Chinese soldiers here were tasked with protecting these civilians in official UN camps. The camps themselves had very little in terms of protection against an assault by combat-hardened troops backed by artillery and tanks. These camps were more refugee camps than they were military redoubts, and that mistake would be costly. Protected mainly by barbed wire fences, sand-filled HESCO boxes, wooden guard towers, and chain-link fences, the Chinese UN troops were not in a good situation. To make matters worse, two different and warring armies were converging on Juba. One army had the current president at the helm, and the other army was commanded by the former vice president. 
In terms of strength estimates, no one is sure of the number of government troops present, but the generally accepted number of rebel troops was around 1,400. On July 8, both armies attacked the city and the UN-run camps. To no one's surprise, the two armies observed no rules of engagement and attacked everyone they came across. A widespread campaign of looting and violence commenced, with the civilians stuck in the crossfire, looking to the UN soldiers to do the exact thing that they were there to do and what they are named for, keep the peace. The Chinese peacekeepers were completely outgunned, outnumbered, and overwhelmed. They fought as best as they could, but only really had light squad-level weapons and a handful of armored troop carriers. As a result, the Chinese troops were forced to retreat further into the camps and set up a last stand. The civilians caught up in this madness were brutally killed, tortured, and forced to endure other unspeakable horrors. In addition to this, a UN aid warehouse was raided and emptied of its food and medical supplies. This aid was being directly used to help the refugees of war and was estimated to be worth a total of $30 million and enough food to help 200,000 people for over a month. The Chinese soldiers did the best they could, fighting back against a superior force. They did successfully deter assaults into the heart of the camps and help defend the 9,000 civilians sheltering there. After three days of fighting, countless civilians, militiamen, and two Chinese soldiers were dead. The Chinese soldiers died when a rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG, hit an armored troop carrier near them. The troop carrier's armor is designed more for deflecting landmines than stopping high-explosive rockets. In the immediate aftermath, all anyone cared about was who to point the finger at for this catastrophic failure of the UN's mission. The UN released several scathing reports, claiming that the Chinese soldiers had failed to follow orders, abandoned their posts, and ultimately contributed to the failure. One analyst even went as far as to claim that Chinese soldiers are risk-averse and aren't willing to take the aggressive action necessary to win the fight. The Chinese government obviously refuted these claims, stating that the UN rules of engagement and subsequent policies regarding combat severely limited the soldiers in what they could actually achieve and the equipment they could use. They claimed that the UN kept the soldiers in a defensive posture that put them at a disadvantage. What they are saying is that the Chinese peacekeepers were not put into a position to be successful. There was also a high level of confusion here, as there was no centralized command. Chinese troops received sometimes conflicting orders from multiple officers, often from different nations. As with most arguments, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Before this, the PLA had not seen real combat since 1979, which means that any officers with combat experience would be well into their 60s. Not ideal. Training is great but can only go so far. No one knows how they will react when live rounds are flying too close for comfort. So it should not surprise anyone that the Chinese troops here tried their best but simply did not have enough field experience to make a difference. It also didn't help that they were outnumbered and outgunned. If they had their own equipment and vehicles, would it have changed the outcome? We can only speculate. Either way, it was an unmitigated disaster. What happened here was like if the Yankees played a single A-team and got blown out by 10 runs. So while this battle makes the PLA's lack of real combat experience at every level glaringly apparent, it's also a critical failure on the part of the UN to adequately arm and prepare these men for the reality of the situation. Where does the PLA stand today? As of the production of this video, the PLA has about 2 million active duty troops with another 500,000 in reserve. Of those 2 million active duty troops, around 700,000 of them are conscripts, which isn't ideal for morale. Those conscripts go out to serve on two-year enlistments. As discussed earlier, these troops are spread out across the five branches of the service, as well as with various auxiliary and police units. The PLA has a variety of weapons at its disposal. The main infantry rifles issued to its troops are the QBZ-95 and QBZ-191, which fire a 5.8x42mm round. In terms of sidearms, they utilize the OSZ-92, which fires a 5.8x21mm DAP-92. For a bit of a bigger bang, they have the PF-89 unguided anti-tank rocket launcher. For heavy weapons, the PLA boasts a large contingent of armor that theoretically rivals its western counterparts, the ZTZ-99A main battle tank and ZBD-04A infantry fighting vehicle are great examples of this. While they have not seen combat directly, they have all the tools necessary to be deadly. The navy of the PLA is considered one of the most, if not the most powerful navy in the world, with a battle force of 350 ships. For comparison, the US Navy has around 290 ships in its battle force. In terms of firepower, PLA Navy is extremely formidable as well, 
even outpacing the US Navy as per a 2016 study. The PLA Air Force is impressive as well, with 400,000 service members and 3,500 aircraft. They boast an arsenal of modern aircraft including the formidable Chengdu J-20. In terms of combat experience, not much has changed since the debacle of 2016. The only PLA officers or enlisted men with actual combat experience would be the ones who are still alive following the Sino-Vietnamese War or one of the few who were involved in the Battle of Juba in 2016. Either way, not a lot of tried and true combat wisdom can be passed down to the lower ranks. And that's not what you want when you're gearing up for war. The best the PLA can do is train as realistically as possible, so that being said, what kind of training do they receive? All members of the PLA when they initially enlist are taken through basic training, similar to almost all other militaries on the planet. After that, they continue to more specialized training. In recent years, the Chinese government and high-ranking PLA officers have acknowledged that the lower ranks, and especially the conscripts, have not been receiving enough adequate training to prepare them for the task ahead. To fix this, they have stagnated conscription cycles so that they can afford to give units more substantial training and get them as prepared as possible for their new roles. As they say, practice makes perfect and the PLA takes that one to heart. They drill relentlessly every summer, doing large-scale mock combat operations and try to get as close to the real thing as they possibly can. This includes the use of virtual reality systems, which allow the soldiers, sailors and airmen to train in realistic scenarios without risk of injury. In 2023, the PLA focused on enhancing its integrated combat and rapid response capabilities. This means that they are working on efficient communication and coordination between the different branches of the PLA as they respond to a variety of external threats. Looking toward the future, China will continue to train relentlessly as global tension continues to mount. In regard to its hostile relationship with its neighbor Taiwan, the PLA continues to conduct military exercises and training in preparation for the likely amphibious invasion. It's no secret that China wants Taiwan brought back into the fold, but how they plan to actually achieve that is anyone's guess. While the fallout from this invasion would be an international catastrophe, the results of such a move is not clear. Taiwan is preparing as well and has turned the island into a fortress with hidden aircraft hangars, surface-to-air missiles, and enough machine gun nests to make anyone think twice. The Chinese government and subsequently the PLA have an increasing interest in the resources of Africa. As the market for the resources and the energy produced here become more valuable, it will be more important than ever for Chinese interests to be protected. It's really a question of when more PLA troops will be stationed there, not if. So all in all, the People's Liberation Army looks great on paper. It has everything you can want in a modern military, thorough training, advanced weapons, impressive armor and ships. The one thing it lacks that's so crucial to success is combat experience. None of their enlisted men, except for some who might have been at Juba, have any experience getting shot at. For the officers, the only ones with tangible experience are well past fighting age or unlucky enough to have participated in Juba alongside their men. All the best weapons in the world aren't going to mean a thing if the soldiers using them don't have the experience to use them effectively while under fire. While the PLA could be an incredible fighting force when things heat up, all we can do now is speculate. Until the bullets start flying, there's no telling how they'll perform. So while the world holds its breath watching what will happen between China and Taiwan, the actual combat effectiveness of the PLA is going to be a topic of debate. As always, if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know what you thought in the comments as well. Now, go and check out why China's military is a paper tiger or click this other video instead.